Um, this is yours. I've got a story about a girl who likes stun guns on a clip as well. There's a clip piercing one. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> me. Are we, are we recording? <laughs> stun guns on a clip. Are you ready for this? <laughs> wow. Sean. Welcome back to the podcast. Mr. Sean Atwood. <laughs> Sean Atwood. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on, man. England influencer. Yeah. England's Wolf of Wall Street. I'll give you that nickname. <laughs> has it stuck a little bit, has it? Oh, I've been inundated with True Geordie gang oh, followers cool. on Twitter, YouTube. Nice. nice. Yeah. You do a lot of like talks on that at um, schools and all that. Are you, had anyone have seen the podcast? I'm going to schools now and they're like, we saw you on True Geordie. That's fucking mad. Like, that. Yeah. <laughs> Where else they see him? Yeah, awesome. It's the biggest thing in the schools, your podcast. Mm. The lads, yeah. Good all one. the yeah. kids love it, and yet you still swear every podcast. Fuck off if you don't like it. <laughs> That's my attitude. Um, so yeah, good, to, good to get him back on, mate. Yeah. Second time round, we, we, we didn't really cover everything that there was to cover last time. And yeah. also, you came in a little bit blind last time. You didn't quite know what you were in for. Yeah, um, and then we had a great chat. It was awesome. It was a really funny one of my favorites. Yeah, actually. yeah, it's a lot of people's favorites. Um, so yeah, where do we start, lads? How's it been since I last seen you? Just doing endless talks. Mm -hmm. um, got my book out about the Cali Cartel. Mm -hmm. Just uh, an American Maid was a bestseller as well. Bestseller. Yeah, got that. That best goes along with that. Isn't that the? Is that the? Uh, that's the Tom Cruise movie. Old George. Barry Seal, CIA mm. cocaine flying pilots. Did you put anything about... Um, Not about the hand. George Senior being a dirty little man in there as oh, well. Oh yeah, there's a whole chapter on protecting paedophiles about George H.W. Bush. Oh, can we talk about that now? <laughs> yeah, sure, should we just get into that? Because yeah. that's... So wait, there is there really a whole chapter yeah. about protecting... No, because we, we all know that in the elite levels of government there are pedos yeah. uh, who've been protected and it's been exposed in in Britain uh, recently uh, in America there's a lot of video theories on YouTube as Pedophiles well Pedophiles or perverts? Pedos, perverts bit of everything bit yeah. of I mean, all subhuman scum I mean it's all, no, because, well because you're a bit of a pervert but you're not a pedo no you know I'm, I mean? I'm a horny bastard but there's a big difference isn't there let's be honest <laughs> very good point age yeah. limit I go for fully grown nicely well developed women Right, Don't we all know that. You can still be a pervert. So um, that, but still. Anyway, yeah. Um, can we can we just say? So, what did you find when you started researching about uh, George W. Uh, George H. George H. W. Bush. Right, this book is about who killed Barry Seal, mm -hmm. and the two lead suspects are Pablo Escobar and George H. W. Bush. And who was Barry Seal? He was. He worked for the CIA. Mm -hmm. He was flying arms out and cocaine in mm -hmm. to America, all with CIA protection. Mm -hmm. And there was a movie out about him. Tom Cruise played him. Tom Cruise in a played movie. him. Yeah. Last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had to do a complete analysis of George H.W. Bush's life. Mm -hmm. And one of the last chapters is about a senior Republican politician who was part of a sex ring where they were flying these kids all over the country. Jesus. And they even had um, underage <coughs> rent boys in the White House. And then when it came to the investigators who were looking into this because the kids are coming forward and complaining, the kids are getting snatched from some boys home mm -hmm. and um, the guys who were investigating they got killed mm -hmm. yeah. and the kids the ones who were the victims they ended up getting prosecuted right. and put in prison and it was all completely silenced in the, yeah, it was in Nebraska they, they say that uh, Jimmy Savile one of the reasons he went protected for so long and not, was because he was providing children for his royal uh, members and all that he was trying to help people out get their freak is, on which we read? don't know is we true we don't know so, have don't you read Princess Di's book in our own words no what did she no, say respect the dead when, hashtag respect the dead <laughs> right. I do respect I when um, she and Charles are having problems marital problems who did they bring in to counsel her who Jimmy Savile the Fuck royal man. family brought really? Jimmy Savile a DJ I mean, this is a family that if you take a photo of them... It's because he does all the running, it'll make her feel better. <laughs> yeah. Get yourself a running pet. <laughs> this is a family, if you take a photo of them, you can't even speak to them because they're royalty. All right. Yeah, a DJ, Jimmy Savile, was brought in to counsel <laughs> Di, uh -huh. and she said she left that meeting with very creepy feelings about him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, he had works. access to the top levels of the royal family. Yeah. In, in, this is Diana's words, this isn't a conspiracy. So I'm, I'm sorry, who, sure. whoever thinks she's feeling a bit down about things... Get Jimmy Savile, that'll fix it. <laughs> honestly, Jim will fix it. Yeah, honestly, that's the kind of thing. Literally, let's not even go to it. Now then, let's not go down that route. But that's, such a, but that's such a shit thought process that you think, wait, there's, we, we have access to anyone in the world. Yeah. You're the royal family and you yeah. go... Unlimited budget. Yeah, unlimited, you go... Something we've struggled to get lately. No, but seriously, you... 
you go, you go, we've got unlimited budget, we can get anyone, yeah. anyone. Who would fix Princess? I'll give him a call. <laughs> 20 minutes later, cigar smoke at the front door, Diana's going, don't bring him in here, that's yeah. not going to fix fucking anything. Like, yeah. Yeah. Listen, I've, I'm only fucking one pervert, I don't want another one so in the room. So what, what evidence did you find that suggested uh, kids were around the White House and all that? Where did you find these things out? There's a woman who's tired, uh, campaigned tirelessly to expose this because her kid got snatched mm -hmm. off a street uh, in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And um, years later, he showed up. And because she went on the TV and everything trying to find him. And years later, he showed up and he said, Here's, what, here's what's happened. <laughs> I was kidnapped. I was taken. Um, they had at gunpoint, they forced me to have sex with a person. They filmed it. And then I was turned into a male prostitute and just flown all over the country to, to VIP clients. I mean, it's hard to think of a follow-up question to that, but the... Um well, no, I've heard about this before mm. in great detail because um, there was some politicians who were high up in America who were prosecuted for this, but it stopped before it got uh, George. It but everything led to George. Everyone yeah. was pointing the finger at him. And when you see videos of him, uh, and there's also videos of... Um, who was uh, Barack Obama's oh, second right hand man? Yeah, right. Okay, Joe Biden. Joe, did, have you seen the videos of him? I've seen, I've seen one video of him, which makes him, which makes a him long. Bad. It's a long video with multiple children, where as as the children are coming up to him, he's very like, and all of, and all of this, oh, and he's wow. touching them very inappropriate, yeah. and he's whispering into their ear, and it's it's the least amount of evidence, mm -hmm. but yet still leaves you feeling creeped out as fuck when yeah. you watch this, and and. Um, Everything's been pointing to people like George Bush for years, but he's never been done, and he never will be, let's be honest. Well, I did write about Bill Clinton here as well, and mm. he settled multiple rape suits, mm. and his brother Roger was arrested for dealing cocaine. Yeah. All right, I'm call Roger. Yeah. Um, um, but, so you're saying that... Uh, but Bill, these like, are, Bill got his freak on, didn't he? Let's be honest. Yeah. He's, but how come people, more people don't speak about that? Sort of, I mean, I suppose Donald Trump did speak about that quite a lot. A lot of his. my research has been based on... <laughs> Ex CIA whistleblowers, mm -hmm. right? And those guys, when they came out and said stuff, alternative media wasn't very strong back then. Yeah, mm -hmm. they'd pick up on it a little bit, but the mainstream media just came down on them and just you know yeah. put all of these stories out saying these guys are completely bonkers. This is untrue. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh. But going back and looking at all the police reports and everything, you, you can see it's highly documented. Yeah. This is not only just I, looking at, look, just reading up about it now. Literally, it's there's loads of if you well, Google it. But by the book. By the book. Uh, American it's called made. American Made. And I'd imagine that also sort of put a lot of heat on you in a way, didn't it? Because if you're printing this sort of thing, and that's a book that's then a bestseller on Amazon. This was a bestseller on Amazon? Yes. Or that was on the other. This yeah. was a bestseller on Amazon? It was, yes. Uh, a lot of people must then look into that and go, who's this Sean Atwood guy who's printing big books about paedophiles? Interestingly, um, when you Google it, yeah. uh, former US President George H.W. Bush, this was 25th of October this year, has apologised after an actress nearly 60 years as junior accused him of groping her from his wheelchair. Heather yeah. Lynn, 34. I've George I've Bush, yeah. 93. Yeah. Still got the urges at 93. Still going at it. I think he, Bloody hell, mate. He, uh, so they, they, his office released an official statement. He's feeling our arse up in a photograph, yeah, well, basically. Uh, what, his explanation for that is that he has uh, I guess like a degenerative thing or he's older now and so he can't keep his arm I'm not joking <laughs> this is what he's saying it's not, it's not actually incredibly funny uh, his arm drops down apparently and sort of uh, t often to this, the height of a woman's <laughs> <laughs> he's in a wheelchair his her horse is about here so li literally would have to he's got restless arm syndrome I think I've, I've heard of that they, before they've added it as a same. symptom of Tourette's having the groping no. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's not you, I'm, I'm not joking it's yeah. really unusual we're well, laughing about it but the bloke is for a long time being called a, just a disgusting human being I think uh, also after a while people start to look evil don't they when they oh, when yeah. the more that people speak about them as evil people the more they start to look evil Tony Blair looks evil now, the people who've read this are re on the reviews are saying uh, George H.W. Bush was a far more evil person than Pablo and I estimated that Pablo was responsible for about 4,000 to 5,000 deaths Wow. Bush over 100,000 in, um, through wars and everything through wars else. around yeah. the world yeah, yeah. Don't, but then Pablo was much more directly responsible Bush was much more of a sort of sitting in the centre of the Bush did it yeah. with pomp and circumstance yeah. and patriotism yeah. and you know and, yeah. and all the other bullshit uh, has this put any heat on you in any way has people anyone followed up a lot of people are saying it's great and they, lo they love it the people that don't like it are saying it's conspiracy theory stuff and right. they don't believe it mm -hmm. but I think 
a lot of people are waking up these days to what's really going on in the world, so that's, right. that's why things like this are taking off. How can you um, how can you sort of print this sort of thing without someone coming along and saying to you, trying to sue you for example? Well, I've got my own publishing company, so right. I can print whatever I want. Yeah. And if anyone wants to come and say it's untrue, come and sue me. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously, if they then sue you, good the, advertising. The likely, well, a, it's good advertising, but b, yeah. I guess it's also that that if it is true, it's very difficult to sue someone because exactly. it's true. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, come by the book. <laughs> so, American so you're that confident in what you're saying. That I am. You, yes. uh, yeah. 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 Um, for some weird reason when Sean says something I believe it which is and I was watching the podcast back and I thought he told so many stories that if someone else told that I'd go that's fucking <laughs> bullshit Sean. nah you're not a bullshit I thought about that yesterday when I watched myself yeah. I was like Jesus the magnitude of these stories the, the stories when I was watching them back I watched that podcast back a couple of times because I quite enjoyed some of your stories and I remember thinking that doesn't sound like bullshit yeah. but I did leave out my hardest hitting <laughs> most sickly story though which in in the next half hour, you're going to find out what Sean has to say about his hardest hitting story. Join us after this. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he wants to be on TV so bad, doesn't he? I just, I'd love to throw to a commercial break. It just seems like great fun. That's, it's good to not have to do that, bollocks. We're not on this morning. I this is the thing. Already, it's gotten good. Was it awful, Sean? Was yeah. it? That's what they do on this morning, is it? Was it really sad in jail? It's sad a bit, surely. Do you want to? Should I get a tissue? Do you want to cry? Um, it, so are these. These all part of because obviously they're all similar artwork. Are these all part of a series? These are oh. my War on Drugs series. There's going to be four books total, and I've got three out right now. What's the fourth? We are being lied to. The War on Drugs. Wow. And is that a present day sort of thing? Because these are all obviously historic. It's going to go back 150 years. Give the complete history of drug laws. Yeah. How the corporations came in to make weed illegal to protect all the industries. And how that's led to this monstrous prison industrial complex where you've got all the racism, Black Lives Matter and all that stuff that's going on today. Yeah. It ties into one of the questions that came in on you guys' Twitter. Yeah. They said, what stock market stuff are you invested in now? And you guys asked me that last time. Yeah. I said I wasn't invested in anything, I hadn't made my move yet. Well, I have just made my move. This research, actually... Could you... <coughs> you Should we stop and then I'll get in on this yeah, and then... Yeah. No, go, go ahead. So, yeah. C Canadian cannabis shares. Mm. Right. Yeah, because what, what we're happening now is um, full legalization in Canada, mm -hmm. 1st of July next year. Right. California. Nationwide. Yep. Wow. California, fifth biggest economy in the world, mm -hmm. full legalization. Mm -hmm. Previously, you had tobacco, alcohol, and pharmaceuticals putting up money to keep the drug laws tight and demonize weed. Mm. Last week, you had one of the biggest alcohol companies, um, Constellation Brands, who owns Corona, mm -hmm. buy a 10% stake in Canopy Growth, which is the biggest of all of the Canadian cannabis It's a mash made in heaven, that, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Smoking a joint and having a Corona. Dynamite. That's not getting faded. <laughs> <laughs> so the cannabis industry now is one of the biggest, fastest growing industries in the world. It's not that big yet, but they estimate it's gonna go into the tens of billions. Wow. So I've analyzed all these Canadian cannabis companies and I think you could make 10 times your money in the next five years. <coughs> and I've already wow. invested in two of them myself. Mm -hmm. Wow, because yeah. obviously the, uh, as it hits the market, people are gonna start buying it. Now. You're gonna see these other companies like the uh, alcohol companies, tobacco, pharmaceuticals start to buy stakes in these companies. Yeah. Yeah. This was the legitimization of the industry last week when the alcohol company made its move. So, when they, you got, they can't fight them off any longer. They, I think they've realized that we're, yeah. we're beaten here. Whether we try and fight it or not, people are going to do this. I also think sometimes they leave it until a certain time when they just think, right, this is our next stage. What are we going to do next? Let's do cannabis beer. It's the investment opportunity of a lifetime because it's the end of a black market. Yeah. We've never seen anything like this. Yeah. And if you, I've researched this and there's thousands of industrial applications. This isn't about people getting blazed. Yeah. This is, you, you can make anything from surfboards to cookies yeah. from hemp products. Yeah. And then all of the medicinal Pain relief, uses all as well. Yeah. yeah, Cancer, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So incredibly, uh, that's what you're investing in right now. That's what I made my move on. I reckon I'm gonna be a millionaire again in five years. Wow. Partially through this. All the way back to Arizona. <laughs> Arkansas. Arkansas, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, another, another one of your followers asked as well, best book on the stock market. Yeah. It's Stan Weinstein's Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Burr Markets. Okay. 
<laughs> I've read hundreds what of books. What does that mean? What does that mean? Is a phrase. A bull market is if it's going up. A bear market is when everything's going down. So you go long when you're going up. You go short when it's going down. You bet. You sell it before you buy it. Right. And you buy it back at a cheaper price. Yeah. So I've read hundreds of books on the subject. I bought this one when I was a teenager in America, and Stan was my idol. And when I did work my way up into the stock market, um, he started to mentor me over the phone. Yeah, I know, I know, I know this leads into another one of the questions that's coming on your Twitter. And they said, have you got business advice for young entrepreneurs? Yeah. So I say, whatever field you are interested in, find someone who's at the top of the field. Yeah. If they've got books out, read them. Try and contact that person. If you can't contact them, if they won't get, in, you know, speak to you, try and copy their business model. And, and then you've got, you know, you've got a short, <laughs> you've got a shortcut. You don't have to make all the mistakes. You don't have yeah. to make them yourself. You've got a shortcut. That's uh, what I did. It's, it's yeah. true. Come no, I think having someone to look up to is a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I just work generally. with a person I look up to on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> cod, cod, you love Con. I love working with Con. You yeah. really look up to yeah. Con. Um, that, uh, I do think that's good advice, though. Having someone older, someone that's got some of that experience you can listen to, because you will make mistakes along the way anyway. Yeah. It's only naturally part of the process. But having someone who can sort of ward you away from the massive mistakes or silly mistakes is a good thing to have. What happen. annoys me is when people aspire to be like someone and they go, I want to be like that guy. Mm. And, and they're not willing to go through the same things. I'm like, you, you're, you're just a fucking lazy prick at this yeah. point. And I know so many people who say they idolize certain people and they, they say, I'm going to be like them and they don't put the work in. People contact me every day, well, every week, sorry, and say, um, I've got a story. Can you just write my book? And you know, I've got this great story, blah, blah, blah. And then I, you know, I, I say what's involved. Mm. It took me 10 years of sweating blood to write my own life story as a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to put the work in. They think you've just got a magic wand and you can just make them rich overnight. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. You, I meet loads of flakes, to be honest. I get a lot of flaky people messaging us. Yeah. I want to do this, I want to do that. And the minute you start telling them what's involved in it, they just bottle job it yeah. straight away. It, what was also interesting was uh, a similar situation happened with Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney. And Paul McCartney told Michael Jackson, buy the rights to songs. Mm. <laughs> And uh, Michael Jackson bought all of the rights to the Beatles, Paul, the Beatles and Paul McCartney's songs. Yeah. Um, and ironically, Paul McCartney lost a load of money because he gave Michael Jackson that advice. <laughs> to be fair, I think we all know who won in the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Paul McCartney's dead now. So, um, Speaking of, um, yeah, old pedos. Yeah. George H. W. and uh, yeah. M. J. Uh, sure. I thought you meant Paul McCartney, but he's not a pedophile. No, he's as far as we know, definitely not. He likes women. A little bit too much, cost them. <laughs> that did cost them. That cost them a lot of money. Quite a bit. Yeah, he's not a vegan. Um, anyway, uh, wh where were you going to go? I'm just interested to hear what you were saying about uh, young entrepreneurs. Is there anything else that you would uh, advise them in? Because, I, I mean, as someone who wants to start businesses myself and that, yeah. I want to branch out as much as humanly possible. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there any main mistake you think that people make when they're trying to set businesses up and things like that? Main mistakes. <clears throat> I think, like I said early, find someone who's done successful things and learn from them. But also, like you said, you've got to balance that out, put the work in yourself, but you also have to make your own mistakes. Like in the stock market, quickest way to learn the stock market is to lose money. Mm. <laughs> All these kids are out there right now, they've got these trading accounts online without any money. They're just like on paper. Mm -hmm. And they think they can trade the stock market because they're up 100%. Mm -hmm. And they ask me at the schools and I'm like, forget about that account put some money in and see what happens. Mm -hmm. It completely changes your psychology. So you gotta get out there and, and have some real world experience. Definitely mm -hmm. that's a big thing. Um, put in a lot of time and effort into learning your craft. I was told um, <laughs> reading would improve my writing. So I read over a thousand books in just under six years mm -hmm. in prison. Um, even as a teenager, when I first got interested in the stock market, my teacher was giving me classes on my own. I went down the library on my own and ordered dozens of books on the subject and just try to learn everything I possibly could. I thought the stock market was a numbers game. It's not, it's crowd psychology. So it's both. So there's a lot of good books up there. Trying crowd to work out what everyone's gonna do next. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd be pretty trends. good at that actually. I guess tr tr reading trends as well, those <clears throat> sorts of things and how people act. Yeah, like yeah. Bitcoin right now. Yeah. Um, that is crowd psychology. If it's you go back, there's a book called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds mm -hmm. by Charles Mackay. And he documented the tulip bulb mania in Holland yeah. centuries ago. People were remortgaging their houses and everything to buy tulip bulbs. They were, the tulip bulbs were more valuable than gold. Mm -hmm. And this thing completely crashed. And, you know, the, the majority of people lost everything. 
because they invest in tulip bulbs well what yeah. I realised after after I listened to the last podcast so for anyone who hasn't already worked out obviously we've had you on before yeah. you were a young entrepreneur who had a love for the drugs and, and love going out and all of that uh, became very successful in Arizona made a lot of money and then started getting further and further into drugs ended yeah. up getting locked up but one thing we didn't really talk about is and, and not as much as I'd want to mm -hmm. what it was like from the moment you got released to sort of where you are now, because um, yeah. you know the videos are on your YouTube channel, which I'll link in the description below for those watching, where you sort of you're on your way um, out with your family uh, out of America. You're sort of looking at cars, and you're like, uh, so much has changed in ten years. You know, people yeah. are texting now; they weren't texting when you went in, and things like that. Yeah. Um, what was it like rehabilitating yourself and getting back into just normal life? Well, with the phones, I'd banned phones. People, were, I was using um, pay phones to do my calls because mm -hmm. the cops, when I, before I got arrested, obviously mm -hmm. the cops can trace your phone and all that kind of stuff. So I wasn't hip mm -hmm. to texting because I stayed away from phones. So yeah, my sister was in the car and she was just showing me how to do all the texting and stuff. And in the prison, I've been writing everything down and I said, yeah, you know, the thought of getting on a computer and writing mortifies me. I'm just gonna write all, all my work down and keep, keep going like this. <laughs> and slowly, slowly I got on the computer and got on Microsoft Word and now I'm on Dragon. Yeah. It took me 10 years to write my life story. I was like this, but Dragon dictation software. <coughs> now, I'm pumping out three books a year. It's great. That's what like, is um, yeah. your your family after everything you've been through? They obviously know that you're not a normal guy. Yeah. How um, now that you're talking in schools and you're sort of leading a good example yeah. as opposed to the way you did live your life? How do you think they view you now? Well, one of the questions that came in was about the family side as well, mm -hmm. and um, I can't remember if we got into that very deeply last time. But my mum, I mean, I was blessed. Just, just, I'll say to, in the beginning because I saw so many people get disowned by their family members because mm. of their involvement in drugs in prison and I was blessed my family came 5,000 miles a year to come and visit me out in the desert they'd wait for hours on end uh, to get in the jail and the guards were rude and stuff like that and um, so yeah I was, that, that was one of the things that helped my mental health and helped me get through it was, was the strong family support um, there was a sensationalist newspaper story came out about me Two, week, two months after I got arrested. It was mm. in the Phoenix New Times. It said, English Sean's evil empire. It was 10 pages long. So it was everything I did and 10 times more. And they portrayed me to be a cross between like Walter White and a vampire. Okay. So I called my aunt in Arizona. I said, don't let my mom see this. You know, did my mom and dad are gentle people. It's gonna break their hearts. I said, it's too late, Sean, there's an internet version. Mm. So my mom read it and she had a nervous breakdown. Mm. She was a college teacher. And um, she read it and she ran up to some students and she started yelling at them, I know you've read the article, I know you know what's going on. They didn't have a clue what she was on about. So my dad had to get her and, um, you know, this, this, this stuff, is, I've got to live with this for the rest of my life. The fact that my mom, my sister had counselling. It's like, oh, I do talks across the country and it's almost like I can still see the hurt and pain on their faces that have mm -hmm. caused them, yeah. So, um, How do you feel about that now? How do you? I don't. Even, it's making me really sad talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just, just disgusted in myself, basically. But yeah. is it something you've ever yeah. sort of managed to square away with them? Or? All right, I do the talks in the schools now. That's the positive thing that's come out of this. Yeah. And um, in the beginning, my mum and dad were supporting me and coming to the schools talks because my mum said when I was in the house for like the first six months, I was like a puppy dog just following around the house waiting for orders because yeah. I was institutionalised. Yeah, you said that. Yeah. I'd, I'd done this interview on the BBC and a guy contacted BBC and, and gave me the opportunity to speak in the schools. But I was like a year and a half before I could get my head straight to do a talk. Now in the beginning, my parents did come to some of the talks with me, just out of pure love and support. But then they stopped and they didn't really say why, but they, they didn't want to be reliving it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, don't, they won't come to my talks anymore. Um, but they see the effect it's had on the kids. Mm -hmm. My mum even got up impromptu at the end of my school that I went to. I did a talk there in my hometown with nurse. And they said to her, would you get up and speak? And she was a bit uncertain about it, but she did. And she got up and um, they all started crying. The kids started crying, the teachers were crying, everything. It was like, um, my mum started crying 
and that was it. And she was up there for about ten minutes. The videos on on one of the videos is on YouTube. That was that. I'm sorry, that was the one on YouTube is in uh, Stoke Newington. She spoke in Stoke Newington. Yeah. 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 So, and I have the kid. I have some of the teachers show the kids that video as well. Show the show the effect that it has on the family. Yeah. If you're getting involved in drugs, you know you're invincible. You're a young person, but when you're in prison and your family's visiting you, worried you're going to get killed and raped, it takes its toll on them. Mm. Yeah. What I was wondering is like just generally. I know obviously it was awful for what your family went through because they do seem like sort of wholesome people and that. And you were totally different than yeah. in, in that way. You pushed the boundaries. Um. Have you rebuilt, rehabilitated that relationship to a point where you feel like um, things are pretty okay now? I feel that they're proud of what I'm doing now, but also in my heart it tells me, you know, you put through this thing that was so tremendously shocking to them, that's something that they'll, it'll be in them for the rest of their lives. And so that's, that's what keeps me, I'm, it, it keeps me motivated to do good as well. Yeah. Like kids sometimes say, would you go back to the lifestyle? And I wouldn't, because I've got strength of mind not to, but another thing that helps me is I'd be selling out the kids I talk to and I'd be selling out my parents. Mm. I think maybe you could quit yourself a bit of slack as well though, because you know, a lot of people have made mistakes. Yours just happen to be more costly than the average person's. Yeah. And nobody's nobody's perfect. And it says, it, you know you're a good person because of how much that hurts you. Yeah. Because an arsehole, wouldn't even think about how much they've hurt other people mm. or anything like that. Yeah. Mm. I know a lot of people who rationalise things, bad things that they've done, mm. um, but you're not rationalising it, you're not cutting yourself uh, any slack to me. Mm. Like yeah. uh, One thing I am thinking though, which is pretty good, is the fact that you said that your mum worked with kids and now she's seeing you mm. sort of following her footsteps in a way. That yeah. must be nice for her. Yeah, that's, that's nice for her. Um, my legal fees were 100 grand mm -hmm. because you don't get out. I'd be still be in prison if they hadn't come up with that money. Mm -hmm. And they're not rich people. So they remortgaged the house and cashed in a retirement account. Mm -hmm. They were close to retirement. My dad had to continue work. He continued working after his retirement because, mm -hmm. of, because of that. Yeah, so I see why just, that has fucking stuff, made yeah. you hate yourself a little bit. Like, yeah. um, stuff like that. That is hard to take. Like. Yeah. What happened to the money, you know, after everything went tits up and that? Because mm. you said that I think you'd, you'd fucked a lot of the money away through playing the stocks in your actual business. Yeah. And then the drug money drug money came in. What, what happens when you get arrested and you've got all this cash? Do they just take the lot? Okay. They want to target people who've got money, the police, mm -hmm. so they can get it. It gets recycled back into the police department. They can get more <laughs> gadgets, faster cars, mm. surveillance equipment. And I was stupid enough to put myself in that situation. So absolutely everything I made was taken. Mm -hmm. I'd flown people out, put money in their names. Mm -hmm. Cops had put a virus in my computer, showed them where all the money was. And the, that sensationalist newspaper story t said I was flying out my uh, granny in a wheelchair and putting money in the frame of the wheelchair. <laughs> but my, neck, my granny didn't have a wheelchair. That would look class on a, a life story <laughs> movie though, wouldn't it? It's hidden up a dress, it wasn't in a wheelchair. It was so fucking Scarface, that, isn't it? I, mean, I wrote about Pablo Escobar. He had people uh, like um, people with canes and wheelchairs and, and you could put millions of dollars worth of cocaine in the, in the rims of the wheelchairs mm -hmm. and stuff and, and in, in the canes. Yeah. It's amazing, really, isn't it? It's funny because I met someone recently who was uh, pretty, I'd say, enjoying MDMA specifically, and and they were talking to us, and they were like, because they were like, I just feel like every worry in the world's being lifted off us, and and all my confidence comes straight away, and I feel so full of happiness and love, and it was like fucking hell, like it's like everything you said about it, because yeah. I've never tried it before in my life, but yeah. I was like, fuck me, like everything. It just, it's getting approved in America now for PTSD. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah, gonna use it on the troops. But, but and, and that makes sense because of the effects it has, but mm. also, what are the downsides of it? Like, what, what's the come downs like on it and stuff? All right, the downside on ecstasy, in the beginning, it is, there's not much actually, you know, when you first start out as a young person. Mm -hmm. I just wake up the next day smiling still. Yeah. But what happens is, Every time you do drugs, that pleasure goes down slowly over time. So, and it happens so slowly, a lot of people don't notice it, but they're always chasing those early highs. They want them to come back. So as you do your system in, it does get rougher. And, um, you know, the way we got around that was 
Xanax. I mean, by the end of it, we were partying on 10 different drugs at these raves and after parties on the weekends. And then we take Xanax, anti-anxiety medication, puts you to sleep and you just wake up as crisp as a baby. It's funny because the average person on uh, who I might know who was taking stuff, yeah. they've got the worry of can we afford things. That wasn't an issue for you. If anything, it was like a fucking buffet, wasn't it? <laughs> it, it was. The it way was. you described it, because you had that many contacts who wanted your stuff and you would get their stuff and then... We served it up as a buffet as well in our after-party <laughs> joint. We took all the paintings down in the villa uh-huh. and then just put a different pile of drugs on each painting and had it like as a buffet served yeah by the girls yeah, couldn't afford trays <laughs> ironically <laughs> let's just use these expensive paintings yeah. on the wall mm. that's mad that yeah and so all, uh, did you feel a great loss uh, for all that money and all that stuff alright first year in the jail I was still wild I'd quit dealing before I got arrested but I was still going out on the weekends getting high so first year, I would have gone back to the lifestyle. I was pining for it back. English Sean, this character in the scene. But my second year, when they told me I was facing a 200 year sentence and I was pushed to the brink of suicidal insanity, I was gonna just slash my wrist because I couldn't take it anymore. And uh, it, it crushed it out of me. And I credit now getting to that point yeah. with the stress and the tension. As a, as a turning point I started to see the needs of other people instead of my own selfish party needs mm-hmm. yeah, um, it, right? once I got sentenced to nine and a half years it was one of the happiest days of my life because I could see when I was going to get my life back all the material shit didn't matter anymore because mm. you, you'd given up on that on the 200 year sentence that yeah you if, you, if you're facing 200 years who cares about the why month, do you think you it know? is that people because I feel like I'm a little bit I, I identify a bit with you in the sense I've had quite an extreme life and I've had a yeah. I haven't really talked about it much but I've had a few moments in my life where I've been like rock bottom as they say yeah why do cunts like us have to go so low to learn those lessons and other people can just stay within the bound do you know like there's some people that are like bowling balls and they just bowl it right down the middle every yeah. time they might not hit all the pins but th- whereas people like us we have to go we have to go right off the tracks and fucking go mental because we're thrill seeking renegades <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell, you and as a minority mm-hmm. most people prefer to stay in a comfort zone but we don't it's a double edged sword because that can lead to huge success because you're a risk taker but it can also lead to SWAT teams and holding on tightly to that soap in the shower yeah. I always had that fear when I was growing up that uh, I thought I'm going to end up doing like time like I had a fear yeah. like, and I've had many dreams where I'm in jail like I didn't, you'd fit in well with your I tats. mean I probably would but like <laughs> but for me being locked up is um it's not prison or anything like that and I hear prison stories that yeah. d- d- obviously they're not great when you hear these stories like the ones that you've got to tell mm-hmm. but that's not what frightens us about it at all it's the lack of freedom yeah. the, the not being able to walk and do whatever because me being such mm-hmm. a a pig headed bastard who wants to do everything his own way yeah. being told everything what you can do and what you can't do all day every day would fucking kill me it's suffocating in the beginning but you gotta get used to it because it's like banging your head against the wall. Yeah, you're just gonna hurt yourself unless you just deal, learn to go with the program. Yeah, it sounds like it, it changed elements of what you thought about yourself quite a lot. You're not the intrinsic identity that you've got, but it changed the way that you saw your own identity. Oh, absolutely. Mm. It was like I had to look inside myself when previously I'd just been rushing through my life. Yeah, you know, a lot of people just living fast-paced lives, particularly here in London. Christ and they don't yeah. take time for introspection mm-hmm. but, but prisoners they re- start to review their lives and, and look inside themselves mm-hmm. and it forced that, that reflection forces you to change it's funny how for some people prison is like a, a godsend in some respects because it makes them do what they should have been doing the whole time it's like someone's holding a mirror up to your soul yeah which is almost something a lot of people some rich people pay to go away on meditative weekends to have mirrors held up to their soul you think that prison could be a much healthier um, place to be for some people. Not really. Not really, because of, <laughs> of all the drug use. That's what. Well, that's what I'm it. saying. Is actually yeah. uh, a lot of people. A lot of people go, get in there and they get into the wrong side of things. You don't. You thought that. Yeah. End up shooting but in hard theory, drugs. like a, like an empty cell, for example. Would, in, uh, in theory, in theory that sort of like. thing should should be good for you. But yeah. because of the way yeah. that the system's set up, it's set up for the people who go to prison to lose, essentially. Yeah, because the prison wins when you lose. Yeah. 
-hmm. when you get re-arrested for your drug addiction which we're not going to help you with we get fifty thousand dollars of taxpayers money per year yeah thank you very much exactly so, yeah and when i when i look at your life when i was thinking about that today on the way down like one thing I admire is people who um, evolve throughout their lives. I feel like so mm. many people I meet, I'm like, you are the same fucking person at 10, 20, 30, 40, mm. 50. You're like, they just, some people don't change. Whereas mm. when you describe how you were as a young teenager and how mm. the lack of confidence and all of that, and how I don't even know how on earth you went through so much of a change mm. and now to come out on the other side of it. What's yeah. it been like to go through so many changes in that respect? Changes that were forced on me um, and as a result of my bad decisions and were necessary for me to grow. Mm -hmm. Like, previously for over 10 years, I just lived for the weekend. It was like I could hear the wolves howling for me to come out to the rave scene. And now I feel like I have changed, but I've got this wolf inside me, <laughs> but I've got it in a cage. Mm -hmm. And the wolf's like, it, it can pace from side to side to the cage, but it can't get out when I hear the music and stuff and I get that excitement, you know? But I've got all these techniques that I've learned from the therapist and from reading philosophy and psychology that have helped me get all that under control and, and mature as a person. Have you found uh, writing quite a cathartic process? Absolutely. So, um, yeah. One of the lessons I give, I've got a life lessons to talk to schools, and the final lesson is about taking time for introspection. Mm. Analyzing your thought processes, how your brain works, your shifts in emotion and stuff like that. And, I, and an ideal way to do that is by writing. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a blog or just a thought journal or just a personal diary, because over time you see you how you mature as a person. You look mm -hmm. back and you think, oh, that sounds silly and I was immature back then. Mm -hmm. And you also see your shifts in emotion. So for example, you know, I was diagnosed as bipolar and I was in denial about that. And then my therapist in prison, he told me to um, keep this thought journal and I wrote an entry down when I was manic. Mm -hmm. And I looked back when I was calmed down. I thought, oh my God, you, you know, there's something, there's something going on there. I'll just read it to you real quick. So this was in prison when I wrote this. Overwhelmingly, inexplicably happy. Feel as if I can accomplish anything. Have written for almost eight hours. My mind is racing with ideas. Creativity and the right words are flowing naturally. I haven't showered, done yoga, or talked to anyone other than ushering a few visitors out. Mm. Time is flying. The announcements of wreck beginning and ending, a two-hour period, seemed like ten minutes. I thought I was hearing stuff when wreck ended because time couldn't possibly go so fast. I've accomplished a lot today. I'm extremely satisfied. In comparison to recent happiness, I'm way off the scale. Why can't I feel this good every day? I feel I could walk to the chow hall and back on my hands and maybe even fly. So just to pick up off of that, yeah. how do you think that sounds when you read it back to yourself now? Like I'm on speed or something? Mm. So my dad has also got bipolar disorder, yeah. and he often writes things, and he, he, he writes things that sound exactly like that. Yeah. And, I, and I'll read them, and I'll think, like, as, as I class myself as a little bit of an extremist, but yeah. me, but mentally I'm on an even keel. Mm -hmm. I never go very high and I never go very low. Yeah. And I and I and I pick up on those amazing highs and those am and some people who have bipolar, I find anyway, they fall in love with that illness because it's a little bit like a drug bipolar, from what I'm gathering anyway. Yeah. And and those extremes become addictive to the point where some people don't even want to medicate Recover. themselves yeah. for it. They'd rather be in that um, in the bipolar. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Do you are you do you take medication for it? They tried to put me on the medication over the years, mm -hmm. and um, I've got a good story about the because uh, the, the mental health. There's team. different. There's We're different. Really um, there's different extremes of bipolar disorder, isn't there? Because yeah. I, I know my dad's was a, I mean, it seemed pretty fucking extreme at one point, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, how would you, what would you class yours as? Less than my mum's, because mm -hmm. my mum has been on the verge of suicide and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And she's had to get on the pills quite hardcore. Mm -hmm. And I've got on the pills on and off, but I find the pills stymie my creativity, cloud my mind and I can't focus on all my goals and stuff like that, mm -hmm. so I've, I've, I've ditched them quite quickly. So in the prison, I'm thinking, this is like mental hospital anyway in here, you know, and it's gonna make a lot of people behave crazy and think crazy. <coughs> yeah. And on the pills, it was, it was okay to be on the pills somewhat in the prison for me, 
but when so when I got out then I go back to my hometown witness and um, you know I'm telling the doctor and stuff what was all the pills was on and um, I said well I feel sane now because I'm out of the prison this was a situational madness because that place was just so mental and they said when someone has got bipolar and they think that they're normal and, and they don't need to be on the pills then we, we actually feel not sh- not should you shouldn't just be on the pills we, go, we actually feel we need to double your dose right now <laughs> right that's what they said to me and it, it, this was so what if you said I feel mental <laughs> give me more wild man did <laughs> yeah. wild man did and I'll, I'll get to that one in a minute we, we need to get to the wild man story all next right, right. so what um, happened with you um so double your dosage they, they, they double my dosage and I'm taking it home I've got no money back then you know I'm on the dole and stuff like that and I've, I'm supposed to be taking these pills for income support and I'm like oh what am I going to do so then they start saying um, we want to do blood tests on you to see if you're taking the pills because I'm that. starting to flush them down the toilet and stuff because yeah, yeah. those feelings they were giving me and then they wanted to do home visits and then they were threatening to section me right. so this I was at my mum and dad's house for a year this was all building up and then I moved down south and my medical file didn't transfer and I never heard from him again. Brilliant. So just, just, <laughs> just a question, because I, th- I think this is quite interesting. The people at home would be interested yeah. to know this. What was it like when you did take the tablets and why did you not want to take them? All right. There got to, to be points in the prison where I wanted to kill myself because of, of the conditions and stuff like that, and the mm. stress and the tension. Yeah, we remember how horrible I, they I were. Couldn't, I couldn't sleep as well. That's one of the worst. You can't sleep. Yeah. And um, yeah, once, once, it cal- once that had calmed me down, then they start, then you start thinking, oh, I hate these side effects. That's that's what that was the cycle with me. So I never stayed on them for long. What side effects was it? Was there any ones like? Imagine like um, just they like make you pee a lot and they make you like nauseous mm-hmm. and you're sweating and you're, and you're shaking a little yeah. bit and um, you're trying to get your, the right words out and the right words aren't coming out. It's like your brain's really slowed down. Uh-huh. All these kind of things. And everything that makes you you. It is is it not that type of guy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, erectile dis- erectile dysfunction that. is one, but yeah. I did manage to still wank some. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's not, it's not, yeah. Yeah, they might stop all that then, but that's still working, you bastards. Couldn't stop that, with the, especially with the dick lifts we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> and were a lot of people in prison on those drugs then, I guess? Oh my goodness, there's a whole industry. I think the military is the biggest buyer of prescription pills in the US and I think the prison system which is an offshoot of the military yeah. industrial complex is another one of the biggest buyers so <coughs> in the areas I was housed about up to a third of the prisoners would line up at pill call mm-hmm. and you see them doing what's called a thorazine shuffle where you know they slowed down they're just coming and shuffling towards the pill nurse so there was this like Bulgarian shot putter of a pill nurse is mm-hmm. like Open your mouth, swallow, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. But half of them are like, they're, they're putting them the pills in funky places yeah. in their mouths because there's a whole black market for the pills. Yeah, you know you could trade your pills for all kinds. Yeah, yeah. We've, I've seen uh, programs. I mean, I mentioned sixty days inside of you where they put regular people in prison and the yeah. CCTV everything. Yeah, loved it. And um, we've seen them hiding uh, the pills and sniffing them and doing all sorts of yeah. Them. Um, but I was just thinking, you know, like going back to the bipolar and things like mm-hmm. that. Obviously, that's really helped you in your in your career in a way, yeah. Because you're creative and, and you want to get everything out there, yeah. and your mind's racing at times. Um, in terms of like going back to just being a regular dude who, because uh, obviously you didn't have a missus when you come out, or did you? No. Um, have you got back there? Like, are you just going out with women or anything like that? Or do you, do you ever? Previously, I've mentioned who have been going out with and I've managed to get stalkers online for the women. Right, wow. okay. Yeah. So you don't have to mention any names, but... <laughs> all right, so you, you, you've got back to a normal life, so Got back to a normal yeah. life, yeah, mm. yeah. Um, oh. On the mental health thing, just real quick, because one of your people asked as well mm. about mental health cases in there and, and what, what to do to improve it. There was a guy I met called Slingblade, right? Mm. This was in a medium, what a nickname that is. medium security <laughs> mm. prison. Buckeye. What did he do? He was a Vietnam vet, came back from Vietnam vet, his head all messed up, and he killed his had a flashback and killed his father-in-law. Fuck, man. Yeah. So he got, he got 25 to life, but he was eligible for parole. Now, it, when I met Slingblade, 
So in medium security, you can go out for like two hours on the, onto the rec field, the recreation field. So everyone files out the building to get onto the rec field. And people are doing like um, sports, pull-up bars, dip bars, and stuff like that. And everyone's in the various cliques. And then there's just this massive guy, like, like the size of a sumo wrestler. Mm. No one's going near him. And he's just looking up at the sky. And he's like, <laughs> he's giggling one way like this. The next one, like, his, arms, his arms going like this, and he's drooling out the corner of his mouth. Oh, yeah, that'll probably not make you want to go over there. <laughs> Yeah. So did you apparently you it snapped that? it snapped on a few people and, and like just you know he's so big and strong oh, bam yeah. just like yeah so um, in the beginning I gave him a wide berth like everybody else oh the other thing was as well because he was so big he had oh. this big appetite so he roamed the chow hall like you know you don't disrespect people taking the food and messing with people to put your fingers on people's trays and stuff like that that's, that's you're going to get in a fight this guy was so crazy he just roamed the chow hall and um, <laughs> Grab. When, when people were putting the the, the chow hall's like this 100 guys file in and there's a big hole like a trap in the wall where a tray comes out so you can't see the other prisoner so you can't get what's called homey hookups where yeah, your homeboys yeah. can give you extra stuff yeah. so these trays just come out trays just coming out everyone gets in sits down you got like 15 minutes to eat so Sling Baby gets his and he eats and then he just starts looking around the hole of the chow hall and um, anyone who's taking the food back, there's another hole that you put your, your, your tray in. What you and because it's garbage, you know, a lot of food gets thrown away. So you'd be like almost about to put your hand to the, to the hole and this big arm would just come bam. He's <laughs> like, he speaks like this. I'm like, do you want that? Do you want that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you have measures of a fucking dog. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was times, literally, when he'd be, at, you know, he'd be on his own table. Mm. And they have like 10 trays, leftover trays. Mm. I think me and Slingblade would uh, be <laughs> quite a lot. Well. Yeah, yeah. You, is, um, and the guards were fine with that. They were just sort of like, let him eat. Well, what can you do? I That's mean, a good question. <laughs> yeah. I suppose we'd rather give it to him than throw it away. So, all right. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in extremes of people. And this was an extreme that interested me, definitely. So I first started out, I, I approached him from a distance by just asking people his story and his history in the prison. That's how I found out what he'd done. And um, I basically, I'd, I'd just start to go up to him and start to talk to him. And he would say things, normal things, but then he'd say, yeah, the, you know, they've got the Hope Diamond waiting for me in California, and when I get out, I'm gonna buy a house with the Hope Diamond, and everything's gonna be all right. And it was really sad. So he was just going in and out of reality and it got to the point where I was giving him peanut butter and crackers and he would come to my cell. And when he, you know, when he come to my cell, um, he'd like fill the whole cell up. And I'd give him some peanut butter and some crackers and he'd tell, you know, I'd start talking to him and stuff. And then he'd just turn around and leave without saying goodbye. And I'd look out and like all the prisoners would see him coming and just be all on the run. They'd all be just getting out of his way, just walking down the run. Now, John McCain, Republican politician, mm -hmm. Vietnam vet. He had a banged up abroad app about his. Uh, he was a prisoner of war. Yeah, his, was it his plane went down and he ended yeah. up getting captured? He was. He was. Um, he ran against Barack Obama when he uh, won the presidency. He was dropping poison on Vietnamese kids, basically from his plane. That's what I was told. Wow, um, he's, he's dying. Asian now. origin, all that kind of stuff. He's dying of cancer now, isn't he? Uh, Is he John McCain? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I contacted him because he says he helps Vietnam vets. Yeah. Because Sling Blade. He was eligible to get out. He'd done his sentence. Right. Mm -hmm. He was so mentally ill, he could not facilitate his release because he didn't have an address to go to. Mm -hmm. So I contacted John McCain, officers of John McCain. Supposedly they helped Vietnam vets mm -hmm. and they didn't do absolutely anything for him. Mm -hmm. And then I researched later on, John McCain was one of the biggest beneficiaries of political contributions from the private prisons in yeah. Arizona. Part of the, the clique. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, I got a letter last year. Sling Blade passed away. He'd done about seven or eight years past the time he could have been released. Mm. What do you yeah. do with a, what do you put him in a, um, a, a mental hospital or something? Like well, that? that's the thing. I had another guy in there who was a legal eagle. He was like a jailhouse lawyer. Mm. He was on the ball and everything. And, and, and he was helping me uh, with legal, legal stuff to try and get the, the way paved for Sling Blade to go somewhere safe. Because his idea was, yeah, it's, one, it's, a, it's a humanitarian thing to get this guy released, 
what happens, you know, if he does something. What are the consequences? We've got to get yeah, him. No, you, we've you got don't to want him just hanging around yeah. outside a pizza hut. Yeah, we've got to get him into looking up at the sky. <laughs> That's mine now. <laughs> the delivery boys won't go anywhere near the place. They're just like, you've not. Yeah. It's funny when you see new prisoners come in and they're walking with the tray and sling. You know, it's this big guy just. Mm. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Well, one thing I would like to talk about is um, making a murderer. Yeah. You wrote a book about that. Yeah. Um, can you give a quick sort of summary for anyone who hasn't seen the Netflix show um, about kind of what happened, what 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 we know, mm. and then what your theory is yeah. about uh, what the real story was? Okay, because I, I don't know the difference right now with evidence. It's been a while since I watched it. Yeah. So before making a murder come out, I was ranting on my blog mm -hmm. about the injustices of the U.S. system. <laughs> no, because I got injustice because mm. I deserve what I got. But I saw the horror of all these prosecutors, all the dirty tricks they played on these people. Mm -hmm. the highest arrest category when I was busted was young people with weed. Usually just throw a black kid in there or a Mexican kid, for, give them five years for giant weed, stuff like that. It made me sick just to see what was going on, filling all these private prisons. So it opened my heart. And um, when Making a Murderer come out, when Netflix premiered just over a year ago, the whole world just lit up. Out, this outcry about these things that I've been ranting about. Mm. So I thought, I'm gonna put some videos online because people are gonna wanna help these guys. They're gonna wanna send them things in prison, buy them things, mm -hmm. write to them. You can't just send a letter to a prisoner. You know, people, hundreds of letters got sent back because they hadn't put Stephen Avery's prison number mm. on the envelope. Right. So all these rules you gotta follow. This was, you know, I, I started, my dad started my YouTube channel when I got released um, mm -hmm. almost 10 years ago. And it had like a thousand or something followers like up to about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Making a murder come out. I put these videos on my YouTube channel and my subs were jumping like thousands. Mm -hmm. And um, all the, I got all these responses from these people all over the world that wanted to help these guys, send them letters, send them money. And I was putting all the procedures down there. I, I got in touch with the family members and stuff. Uh -huh. And, um, I thought, right, another good thing I can do is write a book about these guys. Uh -huh. The profits from it are gonna to go to charity. Half of it has gone to, so far, it's called On Making a Murderer, and half of it's gone to the lawyers representing Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. Mm -hmm. And the other half has gone to something I've set up where I donate books to kids in state schools and prisons. I just good got 5,000 more books just, 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 just come in. Yeah. So you asked, you know, what, what, what happened to these guys? So, so what do we officially know, like provable evidence, okay. and then what your theory is about that? Stephen Avery served 18 years for an attempted murder and a rape that he hadn't done. Mm -hmm. It's a fact that he was exonerated, right? So it was, it was, it was proven that this other guy, a rapist called the Sandman, who was attacking women, his DNA and his uh, her pubic hair was found at the scene. So when DNA testing came around, um, they were able to pr prove this with un beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, and the Sam man, he's doing time for it now. Um, now the sheriff's department picked on Stephen Avery because Stephen Avery had some criminal history, and he had a beef with a wife of a deputy sheriff. So if they thought, all right, he'll do. We'll just get him in. So even when as evidence came to light about this ma this other man who had done the so crimes, so this was eighteen years after Stephen Avery had been inside, they had the evidence. They discovered the evidence then, or did they know the evidence from day one? Some of the evidence they knew from day one, and it was mm -hmm. hidden. The DNA testing came much later because science had progressed. Obviously, yeah. So all they could do was say that the her, the pubic her, was a reasonable match to Stephen Avery, which they did because they brought in an expert, and the expert will say whatever the state wants. Yes, was like blonde, blonde yeah. must be him. Yeah, yeah. With a reasonable de degree of scientific certainty, it's his. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And the jury's going to believe someone who's got a bit of criminal history, or this. But he's got a glasses and a lab coat on, so exactly. must be telling the That's truth. That's how they do it. And this is one of one of the chapters in my the book. box is pay expert witnesses to lie. Yeah. It's called testy lying, it's so common in America. So some of the staff of the prosecutor's office, the Sandman had been being surveyed by the police and they said, it's not Avery, it's the Sandman. And the sheriff and the prosecutor said to their own staff, we've contacted the Sandman's probation officer and he's, he's told us that the Sandman was with his probation officer on that day. It's a complete lie. They just made it up to shut their own, shut up their own workforce. Fuck me. Yeah, yeah. So nothing happens to them because they've got absolute immunity from prosecution. Mm -hmm. So 18 years later, they found out he's innocent. They hold him in for about another two years and they let him out. He's about to receive 32 million in compensation. 
the first check for milli- a million or so is on the governor's desk and then Teresa Halbach goes missing who are they going to blame a guy who's about to get 32 million because she'd visited him that day and she was a photographer mm. yeah. oh for the cam- uh, for the car Sorry, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so they got him they pulled him in he was the suspect right away without any evidence and they pulled him in and then they kept changing how he'd killed her where he'd killed her one of his alibis was his nephew Brendan Dassey who, who also was arrested who always also was arrested and is, is presently still inside mm-hmm. Brendan Dassey his IQ I think was like 60 in the 60s or something like that when he was arrested they snatched him from his high school they told him he could go home and watch Wrestlemania go, go back home and watch <laughs> Wrestlemania if you just come with us and, and answer all these questions to be fair uh, that's a pretty good offer <laughs> <laughs> Wrestlemania he thought he was going to go and watch Wrestlemania and Triple H is in the title fight yeah, yeah. so I won't be missing that so after they, 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 they interviewed him for hours and hours and hours and it's, it's heartbreaking I've got these videos on my YouTube channel and basically they want him to say that, that he helped Stephen and, he, and they shot Treaser in the head so the two detectives say what did you do to her head Brendan and this guy like he, he hardly says anything about the entire interview. he's just like mm, mm, mm. And he says um, we cut her her you cut a her? What did you cut a her with? It's just like making things up, you know. It's still the official version now is that they cut a her before they did all this horrible stuff because he just made, he just made this cutting her up. Next, we punched her. Where did you punch in the face? They want him to say that he shot her in the head. Mm. And he's going, it's, it's like a guessing game, basically. And in the end, they, they say to Brendan, um, who, shot her, who shot her in the head, Brendan? Just a game to say. Yeah. And he goes, ooh, Stephen did. You're joking. <laughs> Cause he, cause he just wants he just wants to give him the right answer so he can go home and watch Wrestlemania right yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. so basically oh, they, yeah. They, they, they yeah they essentially get him into a point where he feels like he's giving the right answer Correct. because they yeah they to bully fair, him so long that's if terrible I was in you know getting interviewed and someone said I've just got to say Lauren shot someone so I could go watch Wrestlemania yeah <laughs> so, who do you want to say shot yeah. it's fine his favourite wrestlers are campaigning for him now exactly. and everything oh really that's yeah. mad that. yeah because I remember when um when it was said that he was going to be released, one of the main comments uh, in the articles was because uh, it was right before WrestleMania, yeah. <laughs> the next WrestleMania, obviously. Yeah, it was saying, "Oh, you'll finally get to say it." And you, 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 you know, you ask what the update is. This is just gone. His case is now gone in front in front of a five pa- judge panel, and the, the prosecutor got up there. This 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 guy. He's like the new one of the new Ken Kratz, and then. Um, Brendan Dassey's uh, attorney Lauren N- Nereida she's absolutely brilliant she spoke from the heart yeah I've seen her interviews she, she's, she's great mm. but the judge roasted the female judge roasted the prosecutor in the beginning and she said look this is I watched this, this stuff with Brendan Dassey and it made me sick mm. you're basically just having him doing a guessing game you know how can you how can there wasn't one shred of DNA evidence saying to show that they took her to this bedroom raped her, tied her to the bed, tortured her, stabbed her in the belly, shot her in the head, um, did all these things. There's, there's no DNA evidence at all anywhere. Yeah. There's nothing linking Brendan Dassey to this crime other than his own confession. The- He's the biggest victim in this whole yeah. case after Treza. Because mm. Stephen at least had some criminal history. Do you think this was an innocent, everyone, this was so, innocent kid. So do you think that they're just in a situation now where that so much has gone on that they can't, to save face, they've just got to bury these two? If they let them out, this opens the floodgates yeah. to all the wrongdoing, such as the state crime lab, yeah. and all of the prisoners that have been convicted by these same prosecutors in the crime lab of Wisconsin are then going to be able to sue these guys. The floodgates. It, we're talking hundreds of millions, if not in the billions. <laughs> mm, it's wow. all about money. They won't let those guys out because not just they'll have to pay them money, but they have to pay money to everybody else that, who's going to do when these floodgates mm-hmm. open. Which inevitably would happen if... Which inevitably would happen. Yeah, because there's then there's precedent yeah. in America. And, yeah. So you've got the federal court system now. Kathleen Zellner, who's Stephen Avery's lawyer. Do you think, who do you think shot the woman, though? You got any theories right, on that? Zellner has filed a, a huge motion, which is over a thousand pages long, and she's put a lot of evidence in this motion pointing towards the ex-boyfriend, Ryan Hillegas. Mm-hmm. He apparently had her day planner and stuff, stuff that she took to, when she went to visit the Avery property. They could tell by the pings from the, <coughs> the cell phone towers mm-hmm. that, uh, that Teresa left the Avery property. Mm-hmm. And Hillegas 
um, was jealous because she was doing some sexy photography mm. and she got together there was a couple she'd done some sexy photography for and she'd actually got together with the husband and she'd also got together with someone that uh, Ryan that the ex-boyfriend knew as well so he was building up this jealousy now that's one of the possibilities I had a possibility submitted to my book which was that um, two people on meth perhaps did it because the crime was so savage you know um, to, to, to stab her and burn her and do all these horrific things the savagery some someone perhaps on meth or the boyfriend thing would like an emotional crime doesn't it when it's, usually, it's usually someone you know the ex-boyfriend yeah. statistically with, with something that that's yeah that bad yeah it's interesting uh, you, I mean, obviously you talk about uh, your interest in mass psychology mm -hmm. are you just as interested in kind of the individual side of it because there's a lot of interest at the moment in the psychology of a murderer and those sort of things I'm endlessly fascinated by all psychology yeah one of the biggest genres of books I, I read was psychology in the prison I went back and read all the original texts you know by Freud Jung Fromm all these different because you read the textbooks and they're just interpretations of the works yeah but it's, it's brilliant to see how psychology has evolved over the years and neuroscience now is one of the areas that fascinates me the most. Yeah. One uh, case I've just been watching on Sky recently was called The Murder of Lacey Peterson, where um, she was a, preg a pregnant woman, mm. eight, eight, eight and a half months pregnant, uh, goes missing, and uh, husband's uh, just out fishing for the day, gets back, she's gone, mm. and there's a load of evidence that says she might have been out walking the dog. There was also, right at the same time, a burglary in the area, yeah. and people saying that she might have tried to stop the burglars anyway. Mm -hmm. um, she goes missing, and the family are appealing, where is she, where is she? And the mm. husband never really appealed the same way, mm. as, but he's only guilty of not appealing yeah. as much as the the family did and being a bit more withdrawn. Anyway, it turns out he was having an affair and two weeks before uh, his wife went missing, he said, um, he told the girl who he was having an affair with on the phone, mm. they've got the, the recorded tapes, um, oh yeah, me, uh, this is my first Christmas without my wife. And uh, she hadn't went missing yet. So a lot of people are saying that's like, he's, he's either clairvoyant or, uh, yeah. you know. Or uh, he's working out a way of not being there for Christmas or, or maybe but, but all he's provably guilty of is having an affair yeah. but when it was proven that he uh, he was having an affair and the weird things he said and the way he acted mm. uh, basically he was convicted of his wife's murder his wife's body did kind of show up in a sim not too far away from where he went fishing yeah. <laughs> but there's no physical evidence the there's no physical evidence that he actually murdered her and yet yeah. they still got him on a on a murder conviction. Oh yeah, I mean they've got the most money, the state, mm -hmm. and it's court is a theatre show. Mm -hmm. Who puts on the best performance wins. Mm -hmm. In the confession tapes, there's a guy who uh, him and his wife in the front of the car, three daughters in the back. Accidentally, there's a malfunction in the car, and he, he goes well, off a bridge. I want to talk to you about this, right? Into the water. But so, so what do you think about this? Because uh, this was on the confession tapes yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, the dad it's on Netflix. The, the mum and dad uh, veer off off yeah. the road and they uh, crash through like a barrier and go into the water yeah. all the kids die and the parents survive there's three kids in the back wasn't yeah. there yeah. do you think that was a deliberate thing because no. they grilled him didn't they for yeah. hours how many hours was it like they said his behaviour afterwards they, they blamed his behaviour saying he, lo he looks guilty he's not reacting right but he was in shock the only thing that made me think uh, there was two things that I found very strange about that. Yeah. They kept the car. So the car that the children died in, they re retained and kept using it. Yeah. Now for me, you're basically driving around the coffin of your children at that point. Like that, yeah. that really baffled me, but maybe money's tight, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I wouldn't, you wouldn't keep the car. And that yeah. was a weird thing. And also, um, there was a lot of dispute between was there a malfunction that wasn't proven that there was a malfunction yeah. so it was his word well, the lawyer said they had other examples of it they had other examples but it's, yeah. it's one of those isn't it it's, it is a weird one it it struck it did the, the car thing did strikes me it, as you? weird yeah, yeah the car the keeping the car stri strikes me as strange i often think people's behavior is a bit of an unusual one because it, it can sometimes be a bit of a red herring where people are oh, well they're not reacting in the way that very often it's yeah. it, they're not reacting the way that i want them yeah, to there's no yeah. textbook way to deal with, close this curtain with death if it? you're gonna kill your kids are you gonna do it in a way that you could possibly die as well 
Well, the thing was, so this, this was this was the thing that I kept thinking to myself is, I'm in the water, I'm in a car, yeah, and me three children. How would you do it? Me, me three children are in the back, yeah, and and I'm at that moment where you've got to try and save everyone as the yeah. dad especially you have to think of it like it's your responsibility to get everyone out alive yeah. the woman gets out alive I don't know how deep the, the car was but I'm sitting there trying to think to myself as far as I'm concerned as a man yeah. if I'm if I'm making out there alive it's because my kids have survived yeah. and I, I'm going to go back underwater and hold myself underwater and keep trying to get them out until I breathe in water myself yeah. so at the very least I looked at them like a coward for coming out of there alive like, there are guys that are die diving in after the dogs aren't there all the time people dive in after strangers yeah. kids yeah. and try and save yeah. other people's kids yeah. so they're not even I, I thought to myself I'd rather have died mm. trying yeah. to save my own kid and, and did it with some I agree, I agree with you on afterwards. that entirely but mm. I think if, you, if you're going in head first in the car mm -hmm. and say your front window bust out or something or, or you, you, the door was open your door was open and the, the shock of what was going on um He's jeopardizing himself. Everything's happening so fast. Mm. I agree. If you see, if you see, you see a dog fall in the water, and you think, "All right, cool, I can just get going and possibly rescue that." It's not going to be too deep. But Silly so deep, so deep, and everything happens so fast. It's going to be a bit different. I agree, but then I also think, and not being a father myself, but I, I guess the my I imagine my instinct would be the kids, not yeah. get out. You know, although maybe at the same time you think, well. You know, it's only a safety belt. It's only a seat belt. The kids can get out, and then you know. But you, you'd still think that there will be uh, something. The thing is, we're trying to look at this from a logical point of view yeah. as well. As if, if you were going to kill your kids, how would you do it? And therefore, how would you do? If, it? if you, if I think to kill your own child is the most unnatural thing to ever think of in the uh, in the world. Yeah, so in order to do it you're not going to think logically for a start so mm. that was a really hard case for me like yeah. uh, did he get sent down for that yeah he's still in yeah yeah. have yeah. you um, have you been watching uh, Mindhunters on Netflix it's I really haven't good. Not, no. I keep recommending can someone else watch this please <laughs> it's about uh, the FBI when they decided to uh, sort of take a shift towards psychology yeah um and obviously I'm quite cynical of the FBI but it's, mm. it's quite a it's quite a, a neat story I yeah. think it's obviously all fiction um, but it's but it's uh, based on things it's based on the idea you know sort of when the FBI began to upgrade their ideas of psychology and those sorts of things yeah. and some of it is it's quite interesting it's obviously huge parallels with today because in some of the cases the psychology gets wrongly used against yeah. someone mm. or like Brendan Dassey uh, was uh, you know guy, uh, or justice can't be served because someone's already done a deal somewhere else in the case so they go against the psychology rather than yeah. those sort of things. It's really interesting to see how uh, before that people just thought of criminals as good and bad. Right. And, uh, but also how so, it, it, it's a commentary also on how some police do still see it that way. A lot of pe people almost deny it. They're like, this person's bad and this person's good. What is a criminal now? Criminals were pedos, murderers, rapists. A criminal mm -hmm. now is a young person getting busted with a bit of drugs. That's the vast majority of arrests. At minimum, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. There's a really interesting... Uh, changed. But it brings up a lot of social um, ideas as well as to how crimes change dependent upon uh, the the social times and those sort of things. Like, you know, apparently different crimes will change depending upon who's president dependent upon all sorts of things well you, you could bugger young boys trends. if you were in the ancient Greece that was, that was normal yeah although that wasn't a crime back then that was much, crime, much more normal. acceptable it was a rite yeah. of passage for yeah, the exactly. young person yeah fucking hell yeah I don't fucking need fricks me out that shit yeah do you know what I do find really interesting what I find myself watching a lot of kids who kill like documentaries yeah because that really fr I'm like yeah. fucking hell kids. evil bastard what about the one in Liverpool I don't think they're evil the one in Liverpool who, do you mean the Jamie Bulger case the one who up to, up to 17 years old he was still getting bathed by his mum that one oh, and right. he was a narcissist mm -hmm. so you'll often find that there's yeah. sort of, there's there's signals like that where you think he's it's, still getting bathed by his mum. He told his girlfriend he was a professional tennis player and he was going to play in a tournament in America. <laughs> and he got his money off his dad's account to, to fly her out there and take <laughs> her to this tournament. And um, he was... He, 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 just made, done it. He, he just made it all up. And he was in the house, he was hammering on the wall and his, his, his dad asked him about the money or something for the flights and stuff. And he just took the hammer to his dad's head and bam, 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 bam. And then to his mum as well, tried to stop it. I blame the Beatles. Did he kill them both? Kill them both, yeah. Yeah. There was one story Silver I was hammer, watching it? recently uh, where I think it was like a 15-year-old lad at school um, 
was a bit of a loser and became friends with like the 11 year olds and he would he would hang around with those kids yeah. and uh, I think he tried to touch one of the 11 year old boys mm. uh, and he was like what are you gay like and, and he just freaked yeah. stabbed him to death hit him in a fucking uh, wheelie bin or something like that and the, yeah. the whole area are out looking for him and uh, obviously his DNA is all like the, his mother came back that day and was like well, what's all this fucking yeah. red marks on the carpet that he cleaned it up as best he could but done a, obviously a bad job and it just makes you wonder like are, are people born evil no okay just no I wrote a book it's uh, not it's not published yet about my mate <laughs> two Tonys who protected me in prison that's a gangster, isn't it? He was Uncle doing 100, 141 years like Uncle June, yeah. And, um, you know, he covers his entire childhood. And his parents used to take him into the basement and whip him. And his mum just said, I'm going to kill you. And just stuck a turkey fork in his neck. Yeah. So he said, he, I'm not, I don't want to make excuses for my crimes, he says. I take full responsibility. But when you're a little kid and these kind of things happen to you, it does make you into an aggressive motherfucker. Well, you have to be, don't that's you? What ha- that's what happened. Nature versus I, I, I believe in born evil. Though. Really? I do. I, I. Why? Uh, the Jamie Bulger one made me believe in born evil. I'm not saying that those two lads who did it uh, had a great upbringing by any ca- means, but uh, when you're that young and you're capable of that kind of murder, I just think that uh, that actually made me think the the devil is a, is a real thing. Like you are the joking. De- the devil, like it, it's so evil that it's almost like. This is like next level shit. This see, I think this yeah. is like spiritual fucking evil. I yeah. feel like that's an excuse for people. Oh, I was born evil. I feel like that's a really easy way. It's just a, it reaffirms people's shitty beliefs about inherent uh, evil and good and bad. And I, I feel like that just it allows people to then put that on other people. I, I'm not that even person's evil. About, that person's evil. I, no, I'm not even thinking about what other people think or uh, uh, the belief systems. I'm just looking at this one person and thinking. But obviously that's yeah, a belief system ha, no but have you had enough of even the experience life to even have a bad life enough to commit something like that without being just evil well you yeah, but surely then there's so much of that you just said they had not the best upbringings like I don't I don't, I don't know to be honest I guess also it's different it's, I find I think it's probably different for kids as well isn't it a murdering child doesn't quite know the consequences of some of the things they're doing there's you know kids are still playing games when they're kids you don't really know the boundaries I, if anything, I remember though. kids in school who were like they would just hit other people and they thought it was a game and they yeah. had no idea what they were doing yeah. but, if, but if anything um, you can look at it the other way which, which is which is also um you are capable of a lot less as a child. You're, you're, if anything, you I was at my most friendly in my life mm-hmm. as a as an eleven year old kid. I was at my most harmless at that age. Mm-hmm. I was least capable because I, I had uh, the least amount of knowledge of the horrors of the world and, and, and but physically. The, but capable. these kids aren't thinking about those. What they did. I don't always think that kids know about. And you're looking at it with an adult brain looking what a child's done and going, that is horrific. Imagine if an adult had done that. I think kids do things and they don't quite understand the consequences of what they're doing. Well, I, I agree with the consequences side of things, but, but what I mean is the horror of some of the things that we've seen children, yeah. child killers do in the past yeah. is more severe through the eyes of a child than the eyes of say for example at 16 years old I worked in a butcher shop and I'm just boom mm. boom boom seeing flesh being smashed mm. to bits every day I'm desensitised to the act so the value then is a 17 year old lad go and whack someone with a meat cleaver I'm not going to be as frightened to do that I'm not going to be freaked out if any blood gets on us yeah. whereas if uh, if I was to that. say those things as an 8 year old it would it would freak me out even more because mm. it's like what the hell is this I'm just a child I'm not used to this do you know what I mean I, don't, I feel like that's your identity that you're putting on other people though because we had a kid in school who used to tell he used to come in school and he used to tell us when I'm older I'm gonna have sex with that girl mm-hmm. and we were all like oh, we were like eight or nine and we were like what and he was like yeah and we and my dad and I sit at home and we watch uh, sex videos and I remember being like that like that there's something wrong with that yeah. like that's really really weird fuck yeah and he was like when I'm older I'm gonna have sex with this girl and everyone in class was like 
that's really weird mm. but no one thought he was evil it was just like he's just uh, he's clearly I, I had a really you're eight or nine and watching porn with your dad your dad wants uh, looking at like yeah no definitely yeah absolutely. I mean the guy uh, the, the guy is now a cla- he's a classical violinist but it, it, it's, it was, not, <laughs> it was it, a it, classical violinist he went into music uh, it was it, it, I remember at the time even as a kid you know the difference but it was so clear that you he, always know the dad's too uh, it was so clear that it was so clear that he didn't know the difference. That uh, the kid yeah. in saying this was on, this is a fun little I, game. I'm just talking right? from a visual point of view, watching someone die through a child's eyes. I think is uh, harder to handle than through an adult's eyes, and that's why it shocks me more when children do these things. I'm interested. I am interested in why people do get fairly fascinated with murder. I understand it's something that's um, fairly out of the ordinary and mm. you know there, there are aspects to murder and drugs and all those sort of things that mm. are, feel quite exceptional yeah um, do you know that, do you know have you ever seen a murder or are you well I saw people in the prison just get carried out look like they were dead on stretchers mm. yeah. one guy had yellow stuff coming out of his head mm. Jesus and you don't know if they're dead or alive till the family members sue the jail later on yeah yeah but uh, so what led you obviously your sort of ex- your fascination with the extreme probably was, was part of that as well there's, it is unusual though murder is unusual but it's become something that seems to be quite mainstream now well it's all over Netflix isn't it At least it sells huge yeah, yeah. What, what, what's your idea as to why that sells and do oh. you tr- are you do you think it's a dangerous thing that so many people are watching these type of programmes and normalising in a way and, and, and uh, getting a buzz off of them according to neuroscience when something horrific when we see something horrific happening and this goes back to the prehistoric times when the threats were chasing us our brains release a certain chemical yeah. which excites us and makes us remember this more than anything else we're going to remember mm-hmm. this is why it's so hard to get rid of these traumas mm-hmm. mm. so the brain's getting activated by the sight of the horrific thing so if it's a murder or whatever it's, it's a threat it's funny that it's, isn't it's how, defend you, yourself from how your brain remembers uh, those traumatic experiences so clearly as yeah. opposed to a happy memory yeah do you know what I mean all the people slowing down there's a car crash someone's been killed on the road blah 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 stuff like that your brain's like whoosh yeah mm-hmm. it's that this, this could happen to me I've oh. got to pay attention and it also it, it, in that attachment also then attaches something which is quite unreasonable to that memory as well so someone who's been through a car crash would then think well next time I'm in a car I could be in a car crash yeah. and that's yeah. quite an unreasonable thought that's very unreasonable and stuff. Yeah. yeah and and I guess that we're going down that that um, path of psychology now where instead of sort of just constantly talking about just people's emotions there's things like uh, CBT and things like that which try and go to the root of what that thought is and why yeah. that why that happens yeah it, was your therapy based on that what's the therapy I've had numerous mean? therapists and I did appreciate CBT which yeah. is cognitive behavioral therapy mm. which means you can control things with your reactions and your thoughts yeah so if some you know if people are picking on you you don't have to react to it mm. you can tell yourself you know I can walk away from this situation I'm not going to get, get that person lock me into their energy mm. that kind of thing because CBT I, I think a lot of people find CBT quite to be quite an effective form of therapy yeah. on a daily basis better than pills yeah very often for a lot of people yeah, yeah. and also I mean I, some people get sort of locked into the pills and before they can find the therapy unfortunately for them mm-hmm. and before well, they do the therapy they're into pills and it's very difficult to get off that for some yeah. people um, have you, did you did you ever find the other way that some people were very encouraging of you getting on the pills and very oh, encouraging of, of you being a bit of a victim of your entire um, well, situation for various reasons some of the medical staff in prison were barred from public practice right prisoners aren't considered human beings it's institutional use yeah we can experiment on them with the latest generation of psychotropic medication mm. So that's what they're doing. Yeah, they were really trying to get you to do get vaccines, get pills, get everything in there. Yeah. Um, I was lucky at the end of it because this one therapist, Dr. O, was into neuroscience, Eastern philosophy. He knew I was reading all these books and I would just go in there and, and discuss quotes with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but people say to me, is the mental health services and there, is it good? And I say, yeah, I had this one therapist, but the rest of it was bad. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, why are all the people getting help from this therapist? Because there's a prevalent us versus them mentality. They feel if they if they say anything to the therapist, it's gonna be used against them in the future. Yeah, which is, again, makes it difficult. So you can't yeah. be vulnerable. Can't be vulnerable, yeah. Which is an, an important part of Therapy. opening up, isn't it? Yeah. Can't be vulnerable at all in prison, yeah. One thing that you said you were gonna tell us at the start was yeah. the worst thing that you've seen in your time in prison. Yeah. 
What was that? This is the most horrific, disgusting thing. I mean, I felt ill just reading my notes um, on the way here. Oh, wow. Probably it's not. Um, it? It's quite a long story. Oh, no, we've got all day, mate. You right, so in, in, in the last <laughs> podcast, mm-hmm. we discussed my friend, my, my six and a half foot trans oh, Zena. friend, Zena. Zena, yeah. Yeah. Um, what a name as well, though. Warrior Princess. Warrior Princess. No, really, it is. It's a quality name because it puts a mental image straight there, doesn't it? Yeah. So Zena was a yeah a, a, a man, but live, living out as a woman. Okay, so Zena believes she is a woman trapped mm. in a man's body. Mm-hmm. Right. And I mentioned last time that she was horrifically gang raped. They stuffed a broomstick in her backside and mm. and raped her while she was unconscious. And she started plucking people's eyeballs out to stop it. <laughs> yeah. Fuck me. That is. It's the way you the way you described that last time. I remember being like, wow. That is not something I'd like to have happen to me. Like you might be thinking that again in a minute when right, we talk about right. what what um, Zena got up to. Right. Right. So I'm just going to desc- I'm going to describe this as Zena telling me through a letter that she wrote what what she did in prison. Oh, so this is her letter. This is this Fantastic. is what, this is her words. Yeah. And you had a correspondence, obviously. Yeah. She uh, writes to me about once or twice a year, something like that. And uh, for some reason, tells this story because it's a very important story that right. she wanted the world to hear. Yeah. 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 All right. I removed all of my clothes and straddling the toilet, I grabbed my scrotum with my left hand and with my right hand, I cut the right side of my scrotum about one and a half inches long. The pain was minimal. Blood began to run down the inside of my thigh. I glanced into the toilet and saw a steady drip, drip, drip from the wound. I placed the razor blade onto my table and reached into my scrotum with my thumb and forefinger. I grabbed my right testicle and pulled it to the surface. The next step was a little more difficult, cutting the inner layer of tissue surrounding the testicle itself. Remembering what I had read in the Mosby Medical Dictionary, I separated my testes with my left hand using my thumb and forefinger. I placed the razor at the top of the cut and buried the blade about one quarter inch into the testicle itself and began to cut down. The testicle came easily out of the skin Mm -hmm. and with great amusement I realized that there was no pain. Holding the razor blade between my teeth I grabbed one of the rubber bands from the bowl and I tied it around the spermatic cord below the spermatic bundle of my right testicle. I cinched it tightly, still no pain. Maybe it was adrenaline that was keeping me from feeling anything, or maybe hype with all the thinking that this would be so painful, which was just not true. I grabbed the razor from between my teeth, licking my lips, I could taste the blood on the razor. I placed the blade directly above the cord about one half inch from the tied rubber band. In one swift motion, I severed the testicle from my body. Then holding it like a fisherman would a minnow, I dropped it into the toilet and flushed. I looked to the ceiling and was the very first real moment I felt pain. Oh fuck, I screamed. The pain welled up like a hot arrow stabbing my abdomen, pounding it as if it were tied to a jackhammer. Coffee was no suitable painkiller. It did not work when I was passing kidney stones five years ago, which was the worst pain I had ever felt. The pain which shot into my body was way beyond the pain a kidney stone could cause. The room began to sway, my eyes were losing focus. It was so intense, I felt this was all I would be able to do. Of course, I was wrong. I set the razor into the soapy water bowl, then I began to breathe. Inhaled one deep breath, exhaled over and over until I regained my focus. I was not going to be defeated by pain, it was no match for my mind. Looking down between my legs, I said, one down and one left to be cut. Fuck off, man. No, did she finish her job? <sighs> We're only just getting started. Mm-hmm. I reached back into my scrotum and found the left testicle residing where it ought to be and brought it forward to the wound in my sack. One small problem, Mosby's medical dictionary never mentioned that the testes were wrapped individually from one another and that there was a divider of thick skin separating the two with a roadmap of blue and red veins crossing one another throughout this section. 
I had two options. One, let go and go through the other side. Two, cut through the middle and hope for the best. I opted for two. Grabbing the razor, I began to chop. This skin, however, was a whole lot tougher and hurt a considerable amount more. I don't know whether it was the cup of coffee or the superstitious feelings which were bombarding my mind at that moment. My hands began to shake violently. I had trouble concentrating. I put the razor back into the water and let go of what I was doing. I stared at the ceiling for a long moment. I did not want to believe the events which were accumulating. It was not going my way. I began to breathe. After a while, my hands felt a little more steady. I reached into my scrotum and began to pull the testicle to the opening where to my total horror the rubber band tied to my right spermatic cord came loose. Blood sprayed from inside my scrotum all the way to the back of the bunk. Five feet. Mm. Now things went from serious to deadly. I felt for the very first time a panic rushed from my head into my belly to my extremities. I shook violently. My mind was preoccupied. I heard the glug, glug, glug of blood in a steady flow from my body. Flowed from the wound of my scrotum into the toilet, like water being dumped from a plastic jug into a pool of water. Son of a bitch, son of a bitch, I kept saying over and over. I looked down between my legs and thought about just how long it might take for me to bleed out. The blood was a steady stream from my body to the inside of the toilet. I reached back and flushed. I watched the water fill the bowl and realized the water was already so full of blood that I could not see the bottom of the bowl. I grabbed the wound in my scrotum and squeezed it shut. I was worried that I was not going to be able to complete the job. Too much bleeding, way too much bleeding. I stood up and went to the door. I pulled the sheet away from the door and looked out of the window. No one was walking around. The officer in the tower looked as if he were asleep. I moved the, shower, the sheet back and went and flushed the toilet. As I stood there and watched the bowl fill up with fresh water, I resolved in my mind that I needed to hurry up and cut the other off quickly. After getting it, I pulled it to the surface of the cut and held it there with my left hand. The bleeding was enormous and I began to feel faint. I grabbed the razor and before cutting, I glanced at the clock, 2.30 p.m. I've been doing this for 40 minutes. At least 10 to 15 minutes of heavy bleeding. No wonder I was feeling faint. Cold chills were up and down and throughout my body. Shaking these thoughts out of my head, I began to cut again. Except now my nerve was shot and I was afraid I was going to die. I did not want to die. This was not what I was trying to accomplish. All I wanted was to get rid of the body of that nasty hormone, testosterone. I wanted to feel like a normal person, one step closer to being a woman. I didn't want to feel what it was like and then die because I bled out. The testicle slipped from my grasp. I breathed out heavily. I was exhausted and frustrated. I was afraid that if I were not able to finish the job, I would never get the chance again. So I reached into my scrotum yet again with my right hand. God damn, where the fuck is it? I exclaimed as I shoved three fingers in as far as they would go into my scrotum. I was searching around and could not find anything which remotely felt like the left testicle, which must have swam away inside my body somewhere. Slipping my little finger into the wound, I shoved my whole hand up inside my body, searching frantically for the elusive left testicle. I could hear a comedic news report inside my head. This just in. Xena, the prison giantess, trying to feel more feminine, opted to remove her testicles using only a razor blade pulled from a disposable razor. During the attempt, the other one decided it was enough, packed its bags and left for a vacation inside her. The medical term for this phenomenon is retraction. However, it is our belief that given the fate of its neighbor, the other one's desire was to hang around for the rest of her years rather than swim into the along the septic canal like its departed um, partner is doing now. I shoved practically my entire hand through the wound in my scrotum looking for the testicle. At one point I could feel my bladder and then something large and squishy, which I believe was part of my intestines. Fed up, 
I stopped the search and began instead to look for the severed spermatic cord where my testicle used to be. I searched frantically for almost a minute and then resolved in my failure. I looked at the clock, it was 2.40. I removed my hand from inside my body and began to ball up toilet paper and shove it inside my scrotum. I patched the cut up with more toilet paper. I named my creation the bloody Van Gogh toilet paper stucco nutsack. I stood up on shaking legs and went to the door. I removed the sheet from the door, looked out of the window and yelled for help. Wow. You like your balls, so that's going to be a really... I just kept thinking, I fucking love my balls. Yeah. It doesn't make you go right to your own balls, doesn't it? No, it just makes you appreciate them a lot more, do you know what I mean? So it was a, an attempt, really, that that was a... Uh, How did she survive that? They got a helicopter. Fuck me. But would have yeah. bled out. She would have died. And then she was on suicide watch. And then she waited and then got the other one off. Well, cle- what, with a blade? <laughs> Again. Clearly, um... They cauterised the wound with a cigarette lighter. Uh, I mean, I've got no idea what it feels like to be a man uh, who uh, feels like a woman trapped inside of that p- man, you know, like, but... Yeah. Um, I mean, how long has she got inside? 30 plus years. Fucking hell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, she's down to 10 or less now, I think. Because mm. I was thinking to myself, yeah. wouldn't it be easier to just wait until he got out? But I suppose that's not really an option in her mind. Really gonna wait. If you're in there, have done it successfully, cauterised the wound, uh, one I knew in there had done it and the wound had got rotten and she got busted because she, it, the rotten wound she was hospitalised and then she got in trouble um, but she looked like mo- most like a woman out of anyone ever seen in there yeah it was Zena no no this a friend of Zena this other one yeah Donna hmm. and um <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. A lot of guys. A lot it does make me laugh the way there's like fellas walking around in prison called Donna. Donna and Zena. <laughs> well, because like, I'm imagining my first day in prison and I'm like, uh, who's uh, who's the lad over there wearing the. Uh, he's lab- lab- well, here's, long here's, hair. Here's the thing. Uh, if, if oh, that's Donna. 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 If, what, getting, what? A, getting a blowjob from Donna it wasn't considered gay. Because mm. Donna's got no nuts, she's trans. Mm. Uh, no, how, how do they decide where a trans person goes whether they go in a woman's prison or a man's prison in Arizona uh-huh. it's quite literally gender it's what you're born with right so I just got a letter from a prisoner sex and gender right I, yeah. I, I had this Mexican gangster mate uh, in prison called Frankie he was like a Mexican Marvy hitman he'd done 29 years when I met him he beat the uh, yeah, he was in for murder of hire beat that case because all the witnesses had disappeared he was a big Handy. big time chess champion and um, he's been rearrested. He's back in. I just got a letter from him because he's bisexual and he's really frisky. And he, he was hitting on me all the time and stuff and um, trying to get me to play strip chess. But he's just found a uh, hermaphrodite in there. Oh, he's, a, he's, so he's made up. He's, li- he's loving made life. Up, yeah. Loving life. Yeah. Every option gone. Yeah, yeah. Spot of a choice of anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, it must be an unusual experience to go into prison in the first place how do you now feel about uh, the, the overall justice system well that's one of the questions that come in from one of your people as well mm. I think the justice system has been, <coughs> has been hijacked by truly evil politicians and corporations that are making money off predominantly young people getting busted with drugs it mm-hmm. was weed yeah. that they took it to the extreme of in America and that's why you've got the decriminalisation at the state level that's the people voting against the politicians and against all this thing it's mm-hmm. not the federal government prisons are for pedos murderers rapists serial killers society needs to be protected from them but the media put all these headlines out saying this is what prisoners are extreme criminals to keep the public shitting themselves when you when your average prison is a black kid or a Mexican kid getting busted with a small amount mm-hmm. of drugs, and w- what's going to happen when weed is decriminalised in certain places? Because obviously there will be some people who went away for crimes purely because of weed. It's going to put the police and the judges and the lawyers and the private prisons out of business, and it's going to save the taxpayers billions. Right, it's already begun in Colorado, and yeah. they're taking that money and giving the kids drugs education with why it. is it being done in Colorado because I always thought of Colorado as a particularly conservative no, I was one of the first ones to change it California and Colorado first ones and Col- I guess Col- Colorado is more of a libertarian state than a democratic when it comes to weed apparently yeah well it's presently 60 something percent of the public in America are for weed full legalisation which is a majority and, and, and that's even bigger that's number, a bigger majority than Brexit even bigger yeah. number are for medicinal use yeah you've got this, this, this kid over there um, 
who gets she was getting hundreds of seizures and they can go into comas and dies these kids yeah and nothing works from conventional pill companies I think her name's Charlotte right and they're using this case now of Charlotte she's on the cannabis oil and, and her seizures are down all these other states now are using Charlotte's case to get medicinal introduced what did you um, what did you think of Louis Theroux's documentary on drugs in America did you see is it a recent one a very yeah. recent one yeah it's the one just come out mate. I mean, it's come over that over the last three, oh, three, three, three weeks someone on cocaine hasn't he Gordon yeah. on cocaine was there yeah. I mean, you saw that uh, I thought it was going to be a bit different to what it was. You were I did, hoping it was actually literally. Did, no, did you did you see it by any I chance? I've seen it. Yeah. So basically, in the first episode, he describes how one of his friends went on a cocaine binge and then uh, ended up dying through um, jumping out of a building or something like that happened. Yeah. Um, and he basically said, "I don't want that to happen again." So we're going to go and check how many of my restaurants have exposure to cocaine. He's dabbing them down, and everything's coming back positive. Basically, that yeah, like everyone's everywhere. on the fucking gear. Yeah. Um, and he goes to say how the cocaine's made and that. And I, I did find that really interesting because, mm. like, you think of how does a leaf become a white powder? And you'd think yeah. it would be. You wouldn't expect it to be the way that they actually do it, mm. um, and how many chemicals are actually used in the making yeah. of it. But in the second one. He sort of um, went back to uh, his restaurant, and I thought it was going to be like a, a few part series. Uh, mm. And he did, he did see some of the like crime that's involved in it. But at the end, he sort of goes back to his restaurant, and he's like, "Right, so don't any of you do cocaine anymore?" And I was yeah. like, "This is corny, this mate. Like, you know, if you want to do that in private, but it it, it really felt like it was." drag every employee he's got to stand outside and watch him give this amazing almost brave heart speech and it sort of got a bit like you're just doing this to make yourself look good a little bit yeah. and, and I don't think he was but that's just how it was shot yeah. it's, it's, some TV shows do end in a really sort of shit way don't yeah. they? It, what's his conclusion going to be what Cocaine's really great, yeah. actually. Well, don't do it anymore. Yeah, but, like, yeah. No, but that's it, it. Was a little bit like it was almost like, wait, right, but how do we end this then? Uh, just get him to tell all these employees uh, that if you're on coke, you can come and we'll set you up with a counsellor. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, that's, that's better than throwing them in the neck. Where they're going to get? Well, yeah, it was just a weird way to end it. But um, I did think that the Louis. I thought Louis Theroux's one. So he's bounced back after Scientology because I thought that was terrible. Way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and his one on drugs was was pretty good because it showed what the current situation is and like well, part of it at least uh, like a, a, how it's used in like pimps are using it sort of they're yeah. getting the the hook as addicted to shit and then they just make sure that they keep them addicted to it and then they yeah. they they're on the game mm. basically that's because it's all illegal mm. so the gangsters have got control of the market instead of the government mm. do you ever think back to that time uh, with all the prostitutes and all those people and sort of feel differently to the way that you feel felt at the time do I feel differently well you must feel differently now obviously looking back at that sort of feeling like, on different drugs uh, <laughs> uh, no I mean like sort of you're looking back and you think well you know you were using prostitutes who were clearly involved in drugs at that time I see what you're saying yeah. the moral uh, yeah it's morally wrong um, here's what happened with us and striptease dancers and prostitutes like that they would come to the parties wouldn't they to let the hair down and get and have a rave and stuff right. and they'd come to our after parties and stuff so, um, not, so it was not, their, not justifying it. So just it no, no, what no, you're no. saying is it was their choice as opposed to you. It wasn't like it were gangsters where you're like, you're fucking coming and, yeah, you're, and you're on exactly, the game. That's what I was trying you to say. You were putting on a party and you say, if you want to come, come. Yeah. But, they hated the customers and stuff like that. And they'd come to us and they think we were cool and they would hang out with us. Right. And so, you know, it led to some of the crazy behaviour. Now, on to clitoral piercings. Um, you, yeah, what was that all about? What was that all about? That uh, you and, all right, so, some... remember in the last story I told you about the woman that I got married with on the Las Vegas Strip. And you're in a you're in a room with the prostitute. Yeah. You, didn't, yeah. you didn't come. Yeah. She, was she a por lesbian porn star? Somewhere? She was doing lesbian internet porn when I met yeah. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is the woman before her. Right. Yeah. The other one. Different one. Yeah, yeah. So the first one was the crazy one. <laughs> there was three wives. There, 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 there was three wife. wives, but there was there was some girlfriends in between as well. So the, you had uh, the first wife was a, uh, the Asian, Asian lady. one that tried to cut my, my balls off. Yeah. yeah. Um, second one. She should have read the letter. Yeah. <laughs> she should have read. She should work for Zena. I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the perfect person. <laughs> yeah. A good hand. Yeah. Um, uh, so the second one was the, was yeah. the second one the lesbian porn star the second the third wife was the lesbian porn star the one in the one. middle what was she, who was she again she was a um, former uh, model got addicted to meth and right. that's and right packing a handgun and that's shooting right, the yeah. waterbed 
Yeah. She actually got clean in the end, though, didn't she? She got clean, got yeah. a real estate license, warned me. Uh huh. She says, here's what's going to happen. Everything she said came true, and I didn't listen. Right, so what's yeah. she being up to then? This isn't that one. The piercing, <laughs> oh, right, it's another one. The piercing one yeah. was in between the waterbed shooter. Uh, so two. And the, le- the lesbian internet porn. And three. Right. So yeah, she was a yeah. girlfriend, this girl. Girlfriend. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, Where were you at this time? Well, geographically were we? yeah were we? when when the piercing got done uh, just in terms of when you were dating her where were you sort of living and alright so yeah all this is in Phoenix Arizona right. she's in Tempe Phoenix Night suburb oh, um, so this is when I'm just starting to I'm, I'm not getting the pills from Holland yet it's not got to that magnitude but I'm getting the pills out of LA so I'm taking a little cruise over to LA with me and stuff is, and that, like a, is that like a road trip what is that is that like a uh a little set of cars just going across. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, two, two, a convoy. Two, or three, two, two or three cars going across. Uh, me and my mates. Okay. Um, you know, has that monitor gone off? No, it's fine. Right, so. If I'm supervising the mission, it's a maybe, mission. Maybe they'll have drugs in one car, money in another car, stuff like that. We've got radar detectors on the cars that'll be because <laughs> they're in the Mojave Desert. It's really flat out there. You got all those speed traps. Um, so we go on a mission to LA and. Um, we go clothes shopping usually as well on Melrose and stuff like that. You're so loving then, life. So then my girlfriend. That's lovely. We'll call her Desiree. <laughs> <laughs> she. Desiree. Yeah. She. <laughs> she sees a piercing joint. Right. On uh, Melrose, bit of a dodgy, bit of a dodgy place, like. So we go in there, and. Um, he goes, yeah, we'll do the piercings upstairs. <laughs> we went upstairs, there was a dog on the sofa, and he just moves the dog off the sofa. <laughs> because we're piercing, we're piercing <laughs> in a crazy place. <laughs> wow. So, That's crazy. So, um, cleanliness. She, yeah. Was it a leather sofa sort of thing? Kind of it, was, it was a dump, honestly. Yeah. But she was so enthusiastic to get this piercing, there was no talking her out of it. Right. So we get on the sofa, she gets a, a Does she tell you what kind of piercing she wants when you go in? Clip piercing, yeah. What, it becomes why? quite clear when she goes, when she spreads the legs. No, but what, why clip piercing? Is there a reason? Have you ever been with a woman with a, woman with a clip piercing? I have, I. Have you? Mm. Yeah. I quite like it in the mouth with the clip, with the piercing. Right. Chewing on the piercing, it's, it's quite a... She yeah. doesn't chew on the piercing. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of like that sucky, chewy feeling. Right. Uh, the thing yeah. is, though, it's, uh, it makes life a little bit easier as well, do you know what I mean? Unless, you've got, unless you've got metal fillings. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Just shove a magnet down there. Um, no, it's just, uh, it sort of highlights the area quite nicely. Do you know it what does. I mean? It makes life a bit easier. It's an adornment, isn't it? It's, it's a pleasant adornment. Yeah, Decoration. Yeah. 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 It's a fun thing. Yeah. Is it? Um, I've actually seen a girl with um, extra decorations down the lips as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> like a tattoo or a so, No, like, um, so basically um, just like several piercings down the lips. Yeah as well like clink 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 feels mad on you <laughs> feels insane yeah yeah no, pleasurable or not uh, yeah. it, it really didn't make a difference to me but she seemed to fucking love it <coughs> right yeah okay. it was just like any other <laughs> and so i imagine hole. the woman you were with at the time had heard similar to this well yeah it was a lot of piercings going on back then mm. you know we, we were even hanging out with people who were getting up on on hooks they had like Loops and in the bodies and the yeah. hooks on the yeah, skin I've and seen stuff that like that. Shit. I saw. Yeah. That, um, I think Vice have got a documentary yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you really need a, a hobby when you start doing that sort of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like just take up. You know, it's quite cards. interesting when they do tug of war and they've got it attached to each other's backs and the skin just stretches right out. That's f- not necessary. <laughs> no, not necessary. That's, that's exactly what. Mean. That's exactly what your commentary would be I'm on. What I'm saying that. is like, what are we doing here? Can we yeah. not? Can you not just have a tug of war? Rollerblade, like other people. <laughs> yeah, do. exactly. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah. Let's go get a screwball. We could do the rollerblade girl story <laughs> after, yeah. the, after the piercing one if you want. Um, so. Yeah, with Melrose, dodgy piercing joint. Clits out. We're on the sofa. Clits not out yet because she's New York Italian. Mm. Thick, brown hair, got this big Italian bush. Right. So he gets the trimmers out. Would, wouldn't bother me for the record, ladies. Just say. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, we know that. Yeah, the amount of stories you told. Anyway, sorry. So it's the first thing, he's got to get the trimmers out and get rid of the bush. Of course oh, he has. The dude. Oh, it's right. a shame. So I'm, I'm still over. She's like, will you hold my hand while I'm going through all this? I'm like, yeah. Then he gets out the felt tip pen. Mm-hmm. X marks the spot, you know, where the gun's going to go in. Mm-hmm. And um, so she sat there, she's, she's crapping it a little bit now. So <laughs> he gets out the gun. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm holding her hand. Right. 
This is a cautionary tale, by the way. Oh, fuck <laughs> sakes. Get, let's, let's hear it. I'm holding her hand. Yeah. All I hear is her squeal like a pig. Right. <laughs> she, <laughs> she jumps like five feet in the air. <laughs> she's just like, like as if she's got a jetpack under her arse. Mm-hmm. Just woof, like her head's going to hit the ceiling. And um, I'm like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> like, she's like, and she's like, like awesome. freaking out. What had happened was, it, it hadn't gone in straight. As she jumped, it had gone in. At an angle. At an angle, because she jumped. And it had gone into the nerve or something. Ooh. Yeah. She lost her ability to have a clitoral orgasm. And it didn't come back for over 10 years. She thought it permanently gone. She was asking her mom if there was such a reconstructive surgery she could get to have her feeling reintroduced. Uh-huh. But did eventually come back after 10 years. How do you know it came back? Just out of it? She, 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 she got in just, contact just to make sure. In my, in my book, Party Time... Um, all of my exes had to agree to be in it right. and they wouldn't sue me in the publisher and she said that there was a happy ending to the clitoral piercing oh, story yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah wow yeah. it's cautionary it is a cautionary tale yeah yeah that's Fucking definitely no. cautionary and I'd then never you get me dick pierced though like that like what's that called a Prince Albert yeah I'd never yeah. be doing that yeah I, I do pull a lot of guys would pull out the piercings in front of us and stuff would and one guy uh, had a, a pier, the Prince Albert and when he went to the toilet he pissed out of both the holes yeah yeah it's, it's a bit of a drag that that is unusual yeah yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not letting uh, anyone uh, with a needle anywhere near my fucking dick like full stop did I tell you about my guy in prison who pierced his dick himself no 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 no, no. All right, so one got of my, a feeling you're gonna though. one yeah. of my co-defendants was this guy called Joey Crack mm. that's a good name <coughs> ironic yeah. he was a really skinny dude like had a, had a kind of face shape of an Afghan hound <coughs> he was a, a big time meth user I can see him yeah yeah they're painting the picture here a few, a few of the meth saws on him and stuff like that big bugged eyes like if people wanted to test drugs and in, in, a, in, a drug tra- in a drug tra- in a drug transaction yeah. go to crack it just crack it take crack long as like a human drug testing kit <laughs> he just get his syringe out just slam it in his neck and be like yeah that's good stuff <laughs> wow so that's so, good shit. <laughs> so um, when the Italian mafia were running stuff where I was housed they had the beefs with the Aryan Brotherhood guys but they took over and I would click up with the Italians and they could move people around the, the jail and get they could give you like whoever you wanted to be your cellmate yeah that's good and um, so they're like yeah we'll put some of your co-defendants in the same cell as you and they put Joey Crack in with me as one of them and um, he, he was off the, well he was on and off the drugs but he was just lively anyway even when he was high so I was I think I was like I was writing on my little stool table combination in the cell I'm in a 45 man pod like one tier of cells upstairs one tier of cells downstairs there's a day room there's like octagon metal tables bolted to the wall all the racial cliques are downstairs and um, so I'm just writing and, and then Joey cracks like yeah I'm going to pierce my cock <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah oh, you're going to pierce your cock in here why is that it's Friday yeah. <laughs> it's just usually the day I do it well, how, how the fuck are you going to pierce your cock in here because I've got jewellery he pulls out this little like metal metal bar thing. Small me, man. And he's like, he's like, but I'm gonna, I'm um, the holes that that it's it's gonna go through. We, we've got to we've got to bend the jewelry so that it's in this shape that goes through the holes in my cock. So, so the jewelry's right. So what is what his theory to do this correctly is that he's gonna get his cock out mm-hmm. with. The jewellery in the cock now, he's, 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 he basically comes out to the day room holding his cock with the jewellery in it and his cock's blood's just coming out of his cock mm. and he says to everyone in the day room, I need help with, with my cock piercing, the jewellery's straight and it's really hurting my cock right now and it's bleeding, I'm going to put my cock where the door closes and someone's going to hold the door and slowly close it on my oh, cock. Good. And someone else is going to watch the distance nah, nah. that it's closing this around my cock to make sure my cock doesn't get crushed. It yeah. doesn't get crushed. Best idea. Best idea. This is. Can I just say it right now for everyone watching? 
this is my job. Yeah, this is this is my job. To hear about other men down. crushing their cocks we sit in down a door. every week and we we talk to uh, uh, crazy people like Mr. Atwood. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah amazing stuff. This is ma- this is mad, mate. This is mad. So a youngster called Sonny Slope's like, yeah, I'll help. Dude. And this other guy, um, Waldo, he came up. And helped. Well, you found him. <laughs> so we've got this operation going now. What well, they actually went. They're actually going to do the door thing. Their their idea. We're doing the door. It's like thing a big now. prison door. I'm imagining. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, this is on the cell door. It's a very heavy weight metal so door. Not, this is why all these people have ended up in prison, though. Because <laughs> at no point has anyone said, that's, that's "Lads, a bad what idea, the that fuck is. is doing?" Like, do you know? This is why. No offense. I'm 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 all about the fact that you know people are wrongfully in prison, but it's. <laughs> This is, might be an indicator as, as, as to, to why, why yeah. these lads have ended up. I imagine the guards just go in, one of them go in, I'll go in, and the other one goes, no. Let's see how this one plays out. It can't be me. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, right. And then I've got you. 20 says it doesn't yeah, yeah. Let, him, let, him, let him try it. Let him try it. I've got 20 on it working yeah. out here. I've got it in this box. Of spot, course, so we I'm get a great sign up offer in prison. <laughs> Click the link in the description yeah, below. The link in the description. His dick's gonna make it through this. It's <laughs> seven to one odds, lads. Twenty-five to one that his dick's gonna fall off. Coral, right? Coral just couldn't be happier with yeah, the results. I know, yeah, to be fair, oh. thousands, well, thousands of captive audience. That's incredible. <laughs> right, here's what he said. Here's what he said. The dick off. The dick off. The dick off. Hashtag the dick off. He walked onto the balcony, waving his red hands, dripping blood from his penis, with an intoxicated look in his eyes. Look, fellas. I put a bar in my cock, oh, and because the guy bar's straight, it's ripping my cock apart. Oh, God. So what we've got to do, fellas, is I'm going to put my cock between the door and mm-hmm. the wall. Mm-hmm. I want someone to put their fingers in the same spot, and because we need to close the door on my cock slowly, and hopefully the door will bend the jewelry. Yeah. But I don't want to completely close the door and crush my cock. So if one of you guys has your fingers in the same spot, we can judge how far we're going to close the door without anyone's fingers or cock getting hurt. Got it. Who'll put their fingers in the door and who'll slowly shut it? Did, and someone... We got volunteers like that. (laughs) Yeah. Everyone's going, well, I've got no plans for today. (laughs) Just uh, just saving the rest of me fucking sentence. Yeah, hell, yeah. Here's the thing, though. As the door was closing, the jewellery slipped twice. (laughs) His penis almost got crushed. It was, it was hard for me to watch. I was like putting my legs no, together. I'm so, putting my legs together. So he's, watching he's watching good. This is going to be great in the book. Yeah. Uh, it's going, sorry, can you just say that again? I thought you said you want to put your dick in the door. I do. Brilliant. This will be chapter. This is going in the movie. Yeah, this is going in the movie. After it had slipped two times, everyone in the, the day room was gasping. Tony yeah. two times is like, I don't have a nickname here. Yeah. The third time, it bent the bar. And Joey Crap was relieved. He said, "That's fucking great. My cock doesn't <laughs> feel. Job. My cock doesn't feel like it's being ripped apart anymore. But Obviously. it's gonna hurt like hell. I want to take a piss. Yeah. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, fellas. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone just went back to what they were doing normally. Exactly. Yeah. And if you want to piss your cock at home, now you know. How. Don't forget down, to go downstairs to your mum and dad and try and get the heaviest door in the house. That's that's Joey Crack's uh, that's his big method. Advice. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? The Joey yeah. Crack cock piercing method. Yeah. <laughs> Always do it between the door. <laughs> just. Because, how long have we been going now, Con? One hour, 55 minutes. Uh, it goes fast, doesn't uh, it? It uh, does, mate, especially with stories like this. The stun <sighs> gun on the cunt. Um, <laughs> the stun gun on the clitoris, it's not a cunt in this. I mean, all right, can we just, I just want to know about that before uh, we, you know. Before we begin to round up. Yeah, all, what right, saying. all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. This, this segues into Wild Man as well, because um, Wild you've Man. had some questions about Wild Man. I've got shit loads more stories, but we're going to have to postpone. We'll do a third, mate. For a okay. part three. Okay. I think we'll do a okay. third. I we'll think we'll definitely, definitely do enough third. for a third. We, love Sean. we could bring a, a, a kinky sexual situation into each one, because we've covered one. Perfect. Brilliant. Um, all right. Now on so, to clitoris. So, just a little bit of background on Wildman then, for, for the viewers. Mm. Wildman was my, my right-hand guy. Grew up with him as a kid. He was a couple of years younger than me. I hung out with his big brother and his mates, and they were mean to Wildman because his big brother led our gang he'd make Wildman eat dog shit he'd say if you want to join the gang you've got to eat dog shit and stuff like that and they'd beat the shit out of him and they did that he would eat the dog shit and think he was in the gang and then he'd, his brother would beat the shit out of him and this is one of the reasons we think Wildman became Wildman because of this, this this treatment that he got from his brother and, other, and some other stuff he said he couldn't even take a wank without his brother giving him a hit around the head in the house wow so 
And there was Wild Woman as well, wasn't there? His, his girl. Oh, yeah. The Scouse girl. Plenty of stories about the Wild oh. Ones. Right. Yeah. So. Um, oh, yeah, the Wild Ones. So I'm, I start to, like, you know, feel sorry for Wild Man getting beaten up, and I'm hanging out with him. And I take him under my wing a little bit. He's two years younger than me. It's a big difference, isn't it, at that age when yeah. you're just little teenagers? Mm. Then all of a sudden he just starts growing and growing and growing. Like he's 25, 26 stone right now. His nose is pointing over here and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And um, so we we become we become mates and we're just bonding as, as, as young people and stuff on, on the streets of Witness. And um, I t- I'm telling him and Hammy, my best two best mates in my hometown, I'm going to go to America and make a million. We go up this quarry called Pex Hill and there's a tree called a thinking tree and we sit on this tree and I t- I'm telling them I'm going to go make them fly you guys over. So I did, you know, I went out to America and left them behind at that point because I didn't have any money. It took me all those years to make the money. So while man over the years started to get in trouble with the police, evening school, the teachers were so scared of him, they had him outside um, raking the leaves and stuff like that. They didn't want him around. And... Um, he, he, ro- he fought someone had ecstasy and he tried to rob this person who had ecstasy and um, he didn't he did the, this guy didn't have ecstasy he, he ended up robbing like 10 quid off him and he took it to the kebab house <laughs> and then he got he got done for armed robbery and he had, so he ends up in prison then for a kebab with some national front guys his cellmate uh, indoctrinating him to all the, the, the prison stuff and um, so I'm thinking alright the way to get wild man turned around get him into America and he'd be, he could be a wrestler you know it's a pos- he can channel his aggression into wrestling so did, did you like wrestling or were you just thinking I'm just wrestler thinking, I'm just in the dream world <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's off his tits on fucking MD and they go oh you'd be a great wrestler <laughs> wild man Wrestlemania wild well, man yeah. and Andre the Giant yeah exactly well, yeah. 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 making a merger all over again I think this is a business opportunity mm. making well. a wrestler um, <laughs> so what I did was I thought alright we'll put Wildman in I'll rent a Wildman apartment right next to the Georgian Dragon British pub in Phoenix Arizona he'll go over there have a beer click up with the Brits and he won't have to roam around and he won't be getting any trouble so <laughs> a couple of weeks I'm going I'm working these long hours and then me and the woman the waterbed shooter <laughs> she's tall she's mixed race very exotic very pretty she was formerly Calvin Klein model she's got 150 silver bracelets on each arm she's very very unusual looking um, so we go to Wild Man's apartment in, in the, at one night it's hot it's the desert you know you can hear the crickets chirping and stuff like that we park our car and we knock on the door and the door opens and there's a little Colombian dude <laughs> like where's Peter we don't want pizza. So, well, no, where's Peter? We don't, no pizza, no pizza. <laughs> Next, I'm like, this is Peter's place, where is he? <laughs> Next thing, he opens the door, and there's like six Mexicans, and they let, it's like I'm trying to get in, and they all just pull the guns and point the guns at me. Mm. We don't want some fucking pizza, no fuck off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I'm like, what the fuck, what have they done with Peter? <laughs> they killed him, yeah. they killed him. So, the waterbed shooter, she's like, just walk up, let's just walk away from him slowly backwards to the car. <laughs> don't, don't say anything else. That's so funny. Don't. We'll just go back to the pizza place. <laughs> so, yeah. you, all right, you didn't order. Sorry. So yeah. we're, we're backpedaling, right? Look at these guys with guns. I'm like, it's cool, it's cool. I'm just, you know, we're leaving. No, I'm not coming to cause any problems. Hearts, I'm shitting it. Wild man just walks over the road with a big smile on his face. Says, oh, you met, the, you met my mates. You met my mates, la. That one's Alex. He's he's the head of the Colombian dealers in this area. Right. The others are his Mexican crack dealers. They like to move around a lot, <laughs> so I've rented them my place. Oh my god. <laughs> They're really impressed by how big a crack rock I can smoke in one breath. <laughs> They're giving it me, me to free to show off to the other, the other clients, and so far I've managed to smoke a hundred dollar rock in one breath. Wow. <laughs> he's telling me like, he's like I'm still even fucking shot by these guys and he's, this is like no big deal to him mm-hmm. so we're like Peter we've just been sh- nearly been shot blah 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 he's oh you're making a big deal like this right so that, that apartment lasted um, about I don't know about two or three months and it ended up with a dead body basically while man was fascinated by guns a guy came over demonstrated a gun to while man yeah um, his girlfriend had gone over the road to buy some drugs from the, the dealers 
and wild man show, said you know show me our guns but we don't have them in England and the guy was showing it him took his safety off and the gun went off and shot him in the head yeah I didn't know this right so I'm back at the stockbroker office um, news I get a call headline news someone's been shot in the head yeah my, it, yeah. it was my hand she's saying the apartment you've rented him there's, 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 there's police tape all around it do not cross someone's I'm thinking he's been shot so I flew up there in my, in my RX-7 um, I've got a bit of drugs in the car and like, I'm like fuck throwing the drugs out the car gotta find out if wild man's been shot but I got so paranoid when I got there because of I was doing drugs and stuff I, 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 I went away and um, I came back later in the day and um, they took wild man the police because they have to test him to see if he'd shot the dude. Mm -hmm. They have this gunpowder test, so they did that. He hadn't shot the dude, they let him go. And um, that was it then, that was the end of that place. He wanted to move out, he was having bad dreams and stuff because the body was on the but, door, but, doorstep. But where's the stun gun on the pussy? Oh yeah, yeah, all right. So it, here's, here's, what, here's, what, here's what we're getting to, here's what we're getting to. <laughs> That's the background on Wellman. That's right. The <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, just, kid. Just so people know yeah. right, what we're getting so, into here. All right, come on. Wellman and Wild Woman. Mm. Wild Woman was his bird in Liverpool, right? Mm. They got together because they were the two wildest people in my hometown. She would got in a bar fight, smashed a bunch of people's heads in with a chair and put them in hospital. Mm. And he was fighting bouncers, so they naturally got together. <coughs> so one day, Wild, Man's, Wild Man tells Wild Woman, I'm going to the shop for a bottle of milk, love. Mm -hmm and he got on a plane to Arizona. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And while he was here at doing all this stuff that I've just described, he met, we went to this club called The Jungle. Good name for a club like. A striptease place. And we also went to this other club which was fully nude. <clears throat> so a fully nude dancer was doing a dance, she, she was working at both of these clubs, at The Jungle and this, and this fully nude. Her name, let's call her, um, Chris, right, all right. we'll call her Christina. Christina. Yeah. That was her name. Yeah, Christina. Yeah. Let's call her Christina. Um, so she's got all these scars all over, like cigarettes, um, fire, and like she's into all this S and M and all this God kind of stuff. You. Now, I think I mentioned on the previous podcast that when I went out to LA and bought the XC and brought it back, we had an apartment party. So Christine is at this apartment party, and um, she shows up with some dude, some bouncer dude, who's like a boyfriend. But, but while man and her are hitting it off and she asks the dude to go and uh, make her some food and he goes off and makes her some food and stuff and um, they've been discussing about how they get off on being tasered because while man just loves to be tasered it, it gives him a sexual and a, and a, a feeling and just a happy feeling so he, 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 she calls him out and he calls her out and so she goes alright I'll fucking do it if you're not going to do it right here in front of everybody so they come to me and, and they say, um, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> so I say to everybody, um, <laughs> can I have your attention, please? Like, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. He's just ding, 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 ding. This is very similar got, to the- a speech to make. It's very similar to the time when you did the, the Joe Weller KSI thing, because that was what they were originally going to do, was uh, taser each other on the balls, <laughs> but they didn't. Uh, I'm imagining him in the middle of, you in the middle of this party just going, Sorry, everyone. You just put the Ferrero Rocher down. Um, <laughs> these two have both got tasers now, and yeah, she's more hardcore than him. Right. So they call each other out, and she's like, "Fuck it, I'm going to do it right now in front of everybody." That's how right. hardcore I am. Great idea. Yeah. So I say, "Ladies and gentlemen, can Ladies I have your attention, yeah. please?" From English politeness kicking yeah. in, and um, I say, "Christine's gonna." Taser her pussy right now for us all. She's wow. going to demonstrate this. Right. If, you know, if anyone's got a problem with that, just just leave the room. Everybody else just wants to be quiet and watch. <laughs> and um, this needs like, perfect it, silence. Yeah, yeah. It's like I was introducing some kind of show. Mm. So she just drops the stuff and gets squats down. And it's like those does a, 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 a the taser gun thing that's With got like a thing in little, between little, yeah. little blue. I'm thinking of Catwoman in Batman Returns. Yeah. So basically, film. she just gets this taser gun mm. and she sat there with this smile on her face and just starts going up and down a pussy. And you know, like the little blue electricity things, little electricity bolt things. They're just dancing up and down, up and down, right. up and down a pussy. And you're just happy with that? Everybody was. 
Yeah, <laughs> we were all really impressed because everyone knew it was pretty hardcore. Yeah, but we've never seen this before. But for a normal person, what would happen if you got tasered on the arm, for example? You'd you'd, you you'd wouldn't piss your pants. Yeah, you wouldn't enjoy it. Yeah, you'd piss your pants. So she's there, and like you might do it for a little bit, and then think, all right, I've got, I can't take this. And she's just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Mm. And in the end, she was like almost coming. Her eyes were like ah, all this stuff. <laughs> and Wild Man's loving it. Wild Man's loving it. What happened then was the, the dude. Um, she, who, did, who did sent off to get the food her boyfriend comes back after does the show and um, Wellman basically says to him I'm with her now thanks for the food and then he grabs the dude's like what What the fuck are you saying like there's almost a fight and he grabs some of the spaghetti meatballs and he puts it in his mouth there's, they're real fine spaghetti meatballs you cooked up for us wow Wellman whenever a violent situation is going to occur his face gets quite serious and one of his eyebrows rises. That's how I know when he's going to hit someone. <laughs> and that's what happened. One of his eyebrows went up. <laughs> I've got a few stories uh, about that. So they're looking at each other now and the dude just could see this guy's a psychopath. And he went, and Still and he, chewing he, on the meatballs. Yeah, and he went left and left from out. Wild man chewing Zena, on the meatballs. Zena looking on in the corner going, I remember when I had one of them. No, that, yeah. That's pretty serious though. Yeah. To... Uh, <laughs> take someone else's girlfriend and then the food he cooked for you yeah like that's some men have um, <gasps> little respect for other men when it comes to taking their she women. was living with him yeah. too but not only that she was living with him food. so him and one of my other big guys <laughs> took her back to get her clothes from his place <laughs> it's amazing the situations that people get themselves into isn't it yeah but then you, the thing is you are around other extremists as well yeah. so it was like in, it's, in it's your normal. life, you might meet the odd extreme personality type who would go and get involved in these things. This was a congregation of nut jobs, wasn't yeah. it? You know what I mean? I had a, I you were the ringleader. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd had a threesome as well with her and one of her other mates. Mm -hmm. Who, the electric girl? The electric girl. Mm -hmm. And one of her friends. And one of her friends who was called Star. I could see you were recounting <laughs> memories when you were doing that. <laughs> and, you was like, and she was just tears when I started. I thought, Do you really remember this shit yeah. very well. She was she, Star was a redhead, <coughs> and um, she had a load of piercings like what yeah. you described earlier yeah, as well. Yeah. Mm. She was really hardcore star, yeah. So they were quite a handful. Mm. Yeah. And you, uh, I guess that was an everyday sort of thing for you having threesomes. At no, the time, it wasn't. It wasn't of as often as I would liked it to have. Sure, been. I mean, sure, <laughs> wouldn't we all? But you, but that was still something that you got into. <sighs> this was the beginning when I was getting into meth and stuff. And on meth, you can just go for hours. You know, you can really pound. Okay. So in the beginning, that is, yeah. So uh, that's hardcore, one of the areas I don't need to. Start. Hardcore people were attracting hardcore people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess in that kind of area, it's like a desert. Things are quite extreme anyway. Phoenix is Phoenix a bit of strange. Do you know? I think it's uh, coming out of this sort of lifestyle, though. Yeah, I think men escape it better than women do generally uh, it, it feels like men sort of come out of this whole thing when they go clean and they get that like oh he was a wild man back in the day sort of thing and even if he doesn't look the way he used to he's got the stories and he's got a bit of an edge about women when women have been wild women it, 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 they never look the same and it wears them down in a different kind of way I agree with that but at another extreme out of all the people who've died out of my mates back then I'd say 90% plus are men. Mm. I lost one another one three weeks ago. Mm. One of my good mates out there, um, he was after partying with us like crazy. He was called the Prophet. Um, and um, he he was on Xanax and he passed out on Xanax just three weeks ago, banged his head against the granite mm. tabletop. Bam, that was it. He mm. died just like that. Yeah. So I think the women are able to temper it more and stop at some point, but the men, if they're going to go all full on, they just keep going. And men are worse for that, aren't yeah. they? And obviously there's also, I think, maybe on a, the, the expectation of the way a man looks is very different to the way that a woman will look as yeah. well. And so you notice it more at a woman because you'd notice scars or whatever, like mm. you say, whereas you wouldn't notice scars. I mean, I suppose you'd notice the scars. Me, the the myth before and after way. pictures get me, like uh, when you see some of these celebrity girls who've been on it and they're just oh, they're yeah. ruined. Absolutely, it's fucking tragic. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Taser girl, she had burn marks all over her. She she got off on people putting out putting flames on, on her, and putting cigarettes out, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Which is unusual in the first place. Yeah, that's extreme. And yeah. you don't still know her? I do. She's on my Facebook. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> is she really? She was. Uh, you know, uh, 
She was one that, because of legal reasons, I had to change all her identity and everything in my book because we couldn't get hold of her for years. <coughs> and she popped up on my Facebook. And um, an old flame, if you will. Yeah, we're in, we're in, we're in good standing. We're happy. Was she a good fuck? Can you imagine mm. how hard? No, I must admit, I'm thinking to myself. Can. I am thinking to myself. I bet you she must have been something fucking else. Like, can you imagine star with a pierced pussy mm. on your face? And the taser one riding your cock. And, I am and now. Then, and then French, I am now. And then French kissing at the same time. Yeah, I could definitely. Yeah. And this is all happening in your heyday, really. This was before the peak of it all. It's building up, yeah. But you're physically. <laughs> this is not even his peak. <laughs> this isn't even his peak. This, this was the sort of. This was Ronaldo at Manchester United, yeah, yeah. not at Real Madrid. Well, no, this Does that make sense? The step over came when he's in Vegas with the hooker, <laughs> and he's he's got that situation going on. Yeah. We're building up to the, to the yeah. Yeah. And. Um, I suppose. And how do you discourage kids from listening to schools? Uh, uh, like, they don't get to hear this stuff. Only you guys do. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. You yeah, guys yeah. have got. We get the real shit. My real shit. That stuff that I've never ever told anybody. We and appreciate also, that. And yeah. we do really appreciate because there's a lot more stories on these oh, pieces of paper. Times, well, aren't there? If, you, if you could, cause, I mean, how long have we been going, Con? Two hours, twelve minutes. Yeah. Um, we, could do, we could do a part three. We, do you, are you okay coming back again sometime mate yeah I'd love to yeah, yeah brilliant because yeah. it's not just about the stories because I mean I think everyone loves that the stories but also yeah. um, you've got so many stories that we haven't even got to the point where we just chop it up do you yeah. know what I mean and yeah. talk about normal stuff especially you read the books you're going to have 10 times more exactly, the books mate. are the books are yeah. a key part quality I mean, yeah. mate you, where can people go find these books if, they're, if they've right. loved half your stories this part insight time is part time and party time are my story they're all on yeah. Amazon and then there's prison time prison time is yeah. the third one it's out of print right now Yeah. Um, I'm also doing talks as well I've got a talk in London November 20th where? in Shoreditch whereabouts in Shoreditch? I'm not exactly sure it's on my events page on my website all my talks what's your website just so seanatwood.com Mm -hmm. yeah. all my social media all my events everything you can get through my, my website yeah. and I'm doing two talks in Manchester in December as well at Texture it's a, it's a nightclub uh -huh. in Manchester yeah Fantastic. I'm doing my hardcore prison story in, uh, in, in November 20th in London Shoreditch wow okay well, we thoroughly recommend that yeah cool. uh, and people can buy tickets yeah just go on my website events and you can click through at the links and you to, all, links to, to all these as well and I've got eight true crime books on Amazon Great. Kindle audiobooks everything I also have some free audiobook codes oh. wow okay so if any of you your, your gang want to message me and well, they want to listen to a free audiobook yeah. I'll send them a code well That'd I think if, uh, yeah. tweet you or something like tweet that tweet me yeah. YouTube me oh the other thing is that since since uh, getting on your podcast I'm almost at 10,000 YouTube subscribers oh. it's all your it's all your guys it's all brilliant your guys. so yeah. if, if you guys if you, your followers could help me get over 10,000 so I can get my certificate yeah. from Google mm -hmm. yeah then <laughs> then you've definitely got something you can take yeah, yeah. then I'm, I'm big we'll, time we'll, we'll link that mate without a doubt <laughs> we'll really true. appreciate your time yeah no That's worries appreciate really appreciate it. thank you very much for coming yeah, back cheers. on part cheers, three brothers. coming soon appreciate yeah, it mate thanks um, Brian and Lawrence wow really good uh, yeah. and yeah if you've enjoyed sitting listening to me and uh, Lawrence chat to Sean Hit the like button, stay subscribed, thanks for watching, and we'll see you later. <laughs>